Hello and welcome to episode 13 of the Cryptid Ramblers podcast. I'm Scott in a cloudy and wet South End and uh, yeah. over in a quite possibly equally cloudy and wet Basildon is yeah. Callum. Indeed. Yeah. Hello. Um, yeah, you're right. It is equally as miserable here. <laughs> it's a... What a joke. I mean, uh, it's a bit of a cliche that being in England, that the weather is utterly, utterly awful. But oh yeah, this is a on. postcard for England today. It, it's just dark, cloudy, overcast, and pissing with rain. So uh, welcome to July. Welcome to the summer <laughs> in England. <laughs> yeah. yeah, which is in contrast yeah, when... to yesterday, which is interesting. Oh, well, exactly. School exactly. yesterday. Yeah. We could we could have all three seasons, all four, all three seasons, all four seasons. <laughs> yeah. We're not on Lanulus. There are three seasons here. <laughs> That's it. This is this is Planet Earth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hang on, sorry guys, my mind went elsewhere. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, just got back. So yeah, yeah, just got back. Still on Lanulus time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And with it being July, um, we are in fact recording on another important day. Indeed, we are we're recording yeah. on the fourth of July. Yes. Happy Independence Day, baby. Happy Independence Day, yes. And to all our yes. American uh, listeners, yeah. Enjoy, yeah, enjoy today. What's, what is uh, the best way then to start off this uh, this episode than uh, the best, most rousing presidential speech in, in history all of American history? Of the United States, yeah. To exist. And should we win the day? The 4th of July will no longer be known as an American holiday, but as the day when the world declared in one voice, we will not go quietly into the night. We will not vanish without a fight. We're going to live on. We're going to survive. Today, we celebrate our Independence Day. Independence Day. Godspeed. <laughs> Godspeed to you all. <laughs> president Thomas J. Whitmore there. Uh, probably the uh, the greatest uh, presidential speech in the uh, history of uh, America, as, as you rightly said. And uh, we thought, what better way to kick off the episode than, uh, than with that? So, um, yeah, yeah, happy 4th of July. Happy 4th of July. And that is very, very uh, prominent for us today as well, the, the connection or Absolutely. a synchronicity. There we go. Already. Yeah. yeah. So Already. as you guys know, we have, uh, by clicking on the thumbnail, that we have found ourselves um, embarking on a bit of a journey into Hellier, Kentucky. Absolutely. And we come across this when we was researching uh, the fairies and the goblins and uh, and such, even, even when we was recording for the fairies, uh, Helia for me was coming up mm. and more so when we came across the goblins because yeah, this documentary that we found on Amazon um, mm. is about a team that goes on the hunt mm. for goblins yeah. in the state of Kentucky yeah. and uh, it, it's named after the town in which this it's occurs called Helia. Right. Now, to give you a quick rundown as to what actually happens the team they receive an email about this this activity that this gentleman's been having That's right. um which coincides very strongly with the case that happened in 1955 also in kentucky and it's a uh, literally called the kentucky goblins case yeah. and it comes from uh, hopkinsville kentucky um and it happened on the 21st of august 1955 and uh, as five adults, seven children um, experienced goblin-like creatures that came from a spaceship. Yeah. Whoa. Came from yeah. a spaceship and were attacking their farmhouse. And they had to hold them off with gunfire for nearly four hours. Yeah, I remember reading that bit. Yeah, it's remarkable. Crazy. Remarkable. Yeah. The two adults, uh, Elmer Sutton and Billy Ray Taylor, uh, claimed that they'd been shooting at 12 to 15 short, dark figures uh, who repeatedly popped up in doorways and appeared through windows mm. as well. Um, so what ended up happening was that these creatures that were 
approximately three to four feet high. Um, they had big round bald heads and what looked like giant sort of conical shaped ears. Mm, that's well. right. Yeah. Um, yeah. What was most in, in, interesting about it is they had large dark black eyes. Yeah. And uh, they were glowing. They had a, a, a strange mm. yellowy green glow. A shimmer to them. to them. Yeah. It's weird. Maybe radioactive. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> yeah. What they found was that these, these creatures kept popping up throughout the night. And they were terrorizing, essentially terrorizing this, this family in, in Hopkinsville. Yeah. Um, what's really interesting about it is that the ex- so-called experts in this case mm. attempted to debunk it. <laughs> As they always by, do. Yeah. By using our favorite creature. Our owls. favorite. Owls. Yeah. Owls. In fact, great horned owls in yeah. particular. So at least it's not a barn owl this time. At least they've... Yeah, it's um, not a barn owl. At least they've mixed it up a bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, you know, it kind of depends. And, you know, it turns out that they were chirping as well. So potentially, yeah. you know, it could be yeah, it owls. Could lend itself weird to chirping noises. Yeah. But no, uh, we're, not, no. we're not wholly convinced by that, though, are we? No, no. Because, no. I mean, we've both seen barn owls, you know, maybe not in their natural habitat, but we've, you know, we've certainly seen them. And there's no, at, at no point do, do their sort of description or behavior necessarily match what these people claim to have experienced, whether it be, you know, the guys in Hopkinsville or, you know, the, the family, um, you know, back in uh, Flatwoods, um, you know, it just, yeah. it just doesn't, yeah, it just doesn't add up. But it, interestingly, and I don't know if you sort of found this, but apparently um, the case was passed over to the Project Blue Book um, investigation, who, surprise, surprise, uh, confirmed it as uh, a hoax. Mm, um, I bet they did, as I think they have done on pretty much everything they've investigated. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, they pretty it's, much seems, go in with the mindset, don't they? Just go in. It seems prove it's fake convenient. and go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's yeah, let's just close the book on that one. Yeah, and uh, let's move on now, shall we? That's, yeah, that's exactly. pretty much what they do. So when you take into account this Hopkinsville goblins, Kentucky goblins case back from yeah. 1955, um, and the subsequent various contacts that the the, the Helia team had, mm. um, it made perfect sense for them to continue with the investigation. Um, but That's right. I don't know about you, Callum, but I found that this this documentary, this season one, because we've only there yeah. are two seasons to this and right. we've so far only watched season one. That's and right. I found that this was less about goblins. Mm. And more about the idea and phenomena of synchronicity. And, yeah. and yeah, for anyone that doesn't understand what uh, or even know what a synchronicity is, it was, um, it was a, a term that was pretty much coined by Carl Jung mm. um, way back. And it's essentially what it is, is it's a meaningful coincidence. So it's uh, the coincidental occurrence of events and especially psychic events or supposedly psychic events, mm. um, such as uh, similar thoughts in a widely uh, separated people mm. or like a mental image that might come to someone at a very specific event that mm. might actually tie into a future event yeah. um, that seem related, but they can't really be explained by conventional means of rationalism or, or anything like that. Um I mean, Carl Jung um, famously quoted, uh, when coincidences pile up in this way, one cannot help being impressed by them. For the greater the number of terms in such a series, or the more unusual its character, the more improbable it becomes. So the idea of synchronicity is it's just more than a coincidence, but it's, it's something that you're experiencing that's maybe putting you on the right path as to where you want to go yeah that's right um that seems to be like the general census as to what synchronicities are but there's uh quite an interesting point that one of the team makes later on that we'll speak Mm. about yeah yeah. about what a synchronicity might actually be yeah yeah that is quite um yeah it's pretty much at the, the very back end of the season i think he sort of makes the correlation so um but yeah you're right it does um you know they think they're going to to hellier basically on a goblin hunt and mm. pretty much from the kickoff you you realize that that's 
not necessarily the case and they're, they're, they're in for far more than what they bargained for um yes. and you know and as you say it ends it ends up being almost entirely centralized around synchronicities and in you know sort of their many forms and yeah if, if you believe in you know synchronicities and and the meaning and, and kind of what sits behind it then it's hard to kind of watch this first season and kind of not identify those synchronicities as the team do you know as they yeah you know as they go along um it, you know it, you'd be hard pressed to kind of debunk any of them really um and I quite like, you know, as you as you rightly quoted Carl Jung um, and a few of his other quotes kind of pop up throughout the, the season. Um, another one that pretty much kicks off the first um, episode, um, I think basically says uh, that synchronicities are a meaningful coincidence, hmm. um, which the, the team kind of heavily rely on, um, you know, throughout their investigations and the various experiments that they do. So, um yeah, yeah, so th- like a good a good example of like a, a synchronicity might be like for for you and I mm. is the the idea of the, of the the book elves or something like that yeah. where um you're you think oh I've heard, I'm sure I heard that there or I I remember seeing it on a video mm. in particular and then all of a sudden yeah. you find it pop up on your recommended on yeah YouTube or um you get a recommendation for a book off mm. of Amazon or something like that. You know, and, I've had that a few yeah. times over the years where I've gone, I'm sure I was thinking about this. I yeah. can't remember where I saw that. And then all of a sudden, it's just like it's just been dropped in my lap. Well, funny you should say that, actually, because um, after yesterday, no, it wasn't yesterday, was it? When we when we last spoke about... Um, Thursday it was, when we last Thursday, spoke about... When, um, when we spoke about, like, tarot cards and tarot reading and stuff. Yeah. Uh, because I, that comes up in in this yeah, documentary, it's yeah, such. it's one of the experiments that they do. Um, I yesterday I noticed that on my Facebook as a sponsored ad was tarot cards. Oh, really? And I wasn't on my phone when we were talking. You know, I didn't use my phone until later on that ah, night. See, now th- th- right now, this could be either a synchronicity or it could be those bastards at Facebook listening in on you. <laughs> yeah, well, tell well, it could old be Zuckerberg, yeah. I'll tell old Zuck the cuck over there yeah, yeah. to Keep fuck right up. off and have yeah. your own privacy, yeah? <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. But I thought that was... Um... Yeah, I thought that was quite weird. <laughs> we were talking about it. Could it could be a synchronicity. Then... It could be. Or it I could think be the phone elves. The for listening in on you, mate. I reckon yeah. it is. <laughs> yeah, that's probably yeah more likely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, let's get into let's get into the Helia really. And uh, yeah, let's do anyone it, yeah. That, so... that doesn't know hasn't heard of Helia, it's um, it follows Deg and Grain and Easy for you to say. <laughs> Let me start that again. Greg and Dana. <laughs> Greg and da- Greg and Dana. <laughs> anyway, Greg and Dana Newkirk, yes. who um, are paranormal investigators, um, and they go a long way back as well. They they mm. uh, they probably won't like saying it, but I think they're kind of like the modern day um, Ed and Lorraine Warren sort of thing. You know, they've got like a yeah, traveling like museum fair, of yeah, yeah. strange artifacts and and everything, and they go off and do these various different. Uh, investigations mm. and invoc- invocations and, and such yeah. because um, Dana is a practicing witch as well. Yeah. And uh, That's right. Greg has certainly been investigating for quite a long time. Even um, mm. I found it quite surprising when we watched the first episode and his old, old team, um, Ghost Hunters Incorporated, came up and I was like, mm. yeah. I remember watching that way back in the early 2000s, like mm. early to mid 2000s, and thinking, I remember watching it on Living TV as Bloody well. Hell. Right. I know, right? That's going back. Living TV, <laughs> yeah. That's when I was like really into that like, most haunted and yeah. all these other various different ghost hunting store, like ghost, ghost hunting uh, programs and, and whatnot. And yeah, I remember it because it was, and I remember Greg because he was like really quite 
aggressive with his investigation, like calling out spirits and going right. calling them pussies. And uh, he was like, <laughs> I remember watching it go, whoa, calm down, Rambo. Whoa, you know, like, <laughs> well, he's, yeah, he's there. <laughs> yeah. It was like, absolutely <laughs> hilarious watching it and yeah. like, just watching these, these angry kids calling out spirits and ghosts and everything. And mm. so it's quite, it was quite funny to remember that from, from the past yeah. as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. No, it's, um, yeah, no, they definitely go way back. It was interesting that actually back in the day, around probably that sort of time, uh, Greg and Dana were actually both um, kind of rival ghost hunters, actually, at the time. Um, and that's kind of how that's they, right, yeah. that's that's kind of how they, kind of how they met. Um, but uh, I, I guess before we jump straight into kind of Helia, I guess just for a bit of background on the group themselves, because it's not just Greg and Dana Newkirk who make up the team there's three other guys that that sort of tag along each with their own um sort of expertise um now the first uh the, the first member um is Cole Pfeiffer who is the uh I guess he's the producer um of the uh yeah. the, the sort of the show and the, the he's sort of videographer he's director, and isn't he? the director um now he is known for hosting a web series um, about uh, the Stanley Hotel, and they carry out various paranormal investigations there and stuff. And mm. um, he saw a blog um, that was done by Dana on their on Greg and Dana's website, uh, Week in Weird, and uh, it was basically a link that shared. I think it was something like the top five. Um, paranormal investigators or, or their their TV shows, and, um, and and Cole's investigations at the Stanley Hotel was one of that top five. Mm-hmm. Um, and she had also, um, I think, she'd also posted an interview about those Kentucky Goblins that uh, that you said about. And right. um, they done they conducted an interview on another podcast. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. To talking about it because they. Uh, they were talking about the the similarities between what they had already received in information and mm. these Hopkinville's goblins and um, Carl right. was listening to it, going, "Oh, this is amazing! This is really good! I can't believe I've only just heard about it." Yeah, and um, basically that. Yeah, they got uh, like a, a back and forth on the Twitter, didn't they? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, basically, um, yeah, there was a bit of back and forth. I think he'd emailed. So Carl would email Dana Newkirk to sort of say, oh, you know, thanks for, you know, thanks for sharing, you know, really appreciate it or whatever. And yeah, there's a bit of back and forth. So I think the Newkirks had been to one of his investigations at the hotel and so that they had actually met prior, um, or, you know, albeit briefly. Um, and yeah, so this was in, I think, 20, the spring of 2016. Um, mm. Their interactions started in, in June of, of that year. Um, and yeah, and as you say, they were interviewing, uh, sorry, recording an interview um, regarding the Hopkinsville um, uh, goblins, because it, you know, as you say, it had links to a series of emails that they got way back in sort of 2012, which is where mm. kind of the Hellier investigations um, start. But really, the first, you know, we're talking about synchronicities, um, and the first one really started um, when uh, Cole was listening to. Uh, you know said podcast on the uh, week in weird um website and uh out of all of the articles that the website could have picked out which was it's like an automated mm. thing where it will just share from the back yeah, auto generated the blogs and stuff that they've previously yeah. done and apparently their back catalog had about 1700 that it could have picked from mm. and, and at this particular moment as cole was listening to their interview on the podcast he saw that there was a, you know, within minutes there was a posted uh, blog about the the Kentucky Goblins that they had, yeah. that, that they had, that they'd already posted. And the thing um, is, there was only two articles out of those seventeen hundred that were about, about it. the Kentucky yeah. Goblins. So yeah, a, a, a one to nine nine hundred to one chance of it being one of those. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. with it being within minutes of them talking about yeah this and having, particular and having that exchange. Um, mm. And it's not like someone has. This is the importance of it as well. So I just want to say this, even at yeah. this point, is yeah. it's a it's an automated system that's done it. So it's based yeah. on algorithms. So it's not based yeah. on I was up the cuck listening to you and going, oh, 
Kentucky Goblins. Let's put that link in there. Let's drop it's, that in there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's actually an automated system that um, is done by algorithms and such. So it had a 900 to 1 uh, chance of picking that chance. particular one. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. chance. Why the fuck yeah. couldn't I think of the word chance? Yeah. <laughs> that a mind I need more. I need more water, mate. That's what it is. Yeah. I need more water. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was just yeah. um. Yeah, it, it was. That was really the first kind of synchronicity. I think that they all kind of acknowledged that they experienced as a, a group because it. That they had their their kind of chance meeting because of this interaction on their website and uh, the the kind of shared interest in the, you know, the paranormal and everything else. But then it was, yeah, it was listening to you know sort of the, their podcast where it had their interview about the hopkinsville mm-hmm. incident and then um yeah the the blog that was posted was one that i think greg had put up um which basically detailed these emails that he'd received mm-hmm. way back in 2012 so bear in mind this is 2016 at this point so again there's yeah 1700 it could have picked to, to randomly post yeah, it happened to just pick this one. So, yeah, that was that, that's what kind of got the got Carl and the New Kirks, um, you know, together basically. Mm. Um, and they also, um, I think, they a guy called uh, Rashad. I think his name was. Um, yeah, he's the principal photographer, really. So, i.e., cameraman. Um, and he's in. He, he does documentaries and works on film yeah, he's productions with Carl and, quite a lot yeah as well and based on what they were part saying. of that part of that circle and they also bring in uh connor randall um who is mm. cole fifer's best friend and he's also a paranormal investigator and again they you think work closely together on the stanley hotel stuff um and so those three along with the newkirks basically make up the the five um sort of hellier team i guess um yeah. Now, just to kind of get into, or to start with the origins of actually the the reason why they go to Hellier, um, takes us back to April of uh, 2012. And Greg Newkirk receives uh, his first email um, from a chap named David Christie. Um, And it was sent to an unused email address from Greg's childhood um, on his ghost hunting page, Ghost Hunters Incorporated, which we'll see you, you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, it, it, they obviously the, the incorporated group disbanded, you know, kind of years prior, but none of them wanted to kind of remove the website because it held a lot of their kind of memories, investigations, and, and everything else on it. So they just keep it in the background, just kind of ticking over, but they don't update it, they don't add anything to it, nothing like that. So, and it is, and you know, Greg himself says, you know, they weren't the picture of professionalism. You know, they were clearly, <laughs> they really you know, <laughs> sort of, you know, ghost hunters and into that type of thing. So for this David Christie to get in touch with them with this particular encounter seemed a little off anyway. Um, mm. But we, I think we kind of later find out how they, how their paths crossed. But um, basically David Christie was, he, he claimed to be a doctor who had recently moved to, Hellier, Kentucky, or Hellier, Kentucky. Hell yeah. He says, I say, Hell yeah. yeah. Hell yeah. (laughs) Can I get a hell yeah? (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. That's that's how the locals uh, say it um, as you pick up on the documentary. Um, And basically, in in his email of 2012, he claims that uh, basically these little creatures would come out from an abandoned mine shaft, which was on the edge of his property, and terrorize him and his family. Um, now, and then that's more or less all of what the, the initial email kind of stated. So yeah, kind of rightly, Greg, uh, you know, initially wrote it off as just a joke and the fact that he, he must have had the wrong email address, because again, that page wasn't dressed up as being the most professional. Uh, I mean, I think the, the main picture was a, a kind of a group shot of him and his friends and they're yeah. all holding medieval weapons and, toy guns, guns and, and stuff uh, well presumably toy <laughs> yeah. guns but yeah um so yeah it just didn't give that sort of vibe that they would more necessarily take this seriously but he he emailed into them you know anyway so there's a bit of a you know a sort of a back and forth i think he tries to kind of suss out you know whether it is kind of genuine or not um and 
not long after that initial interaction, um, Greg receives um, a three-page email from this David Christie. Now, you'll be pleased to know I'm not going to sit and read the whole three pages because it's quite, you know, it does sort of... (laughs) It does it's, go into it's quite it. in depth, but yeah. um, I guess yeah. you'll just paraphrase. I'm going to paraphrase. I'm going to yeah. paraphrase. Yeah. Um, basically, the email claims that over an initial six month period at his home on the border of Kentucky and would you believe it, West Virginia, <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> him, uh, him and his <laughs> him and his family were terrorized by these small creatures. Um, he believes that they are extraterrestrial in in sort of nature and they were the size of basically small children so like a two or three year old i guess um he also believes that they're coming from an abandoned mine which is like i say on on his property um and he said that he said that he was armed but he wouldn't venture into the mine on his own and none of his friends would go with him, <laughs> which, which I think you got to think. Well, I mean, that's fair, fair enough, really. To be honest, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I suppose it's just worth noting. We won't go into too much detail at this point, but it's worth noting that that Kentucky kind of sits above. Well, Hellier, Kentucky is a, is a mining town, yeah. So pretty much dotted around the entire town, the hills and whatever else are entrances to mines because they yeah. used to mine from there. So and I think Hellier was built as a town, was built for the miners to live in. So coal could, mining, in fact. Yeah, yeah. So they could get to and from, you know, the mines without sort of traveling mm. in from anywhere. So it was it was built for that purpose. So yeah, I think pretty much everyone in the town has got a disused mine and shaft mine on their property. On their property kind of somewhere. Yeah. So it's not yeah. particularly unusual for, for this particular area. Um, you know, for that to for that to kind of happen. Um, now, apparently, so again, obviously, Greg thought that you know, not being the face of professionalism, he wasn't sure kind of where where they got the introduction from. Um, but uh, David confirms in his email that uh, Greg's details were passed on to him by him, a man who went by the name of Terry Wrist. Mm. Um, you know, and I'm sure, yeah. as everyone's probably picked up, that sounds awfully familiar to uh, a word. <laughs> yes, um, a, a particular T word that's been very prominent for the past 20 years. Yeah, exactly right. So <laughs> yeah. I think already we could probably agree that that's going to be a pseudonym of, uh, of, of you know, of, of mm. some sort, um, yeah. or, you know, or a stage name or something. Um, now, in the email, uh, David confirms that he'd lived at the property for seven months, but the encounters had only happened uh, in the last three. Um, however, it was weeks before he emailed Greg that he actually started recording it. So we've only, like I say, out of the three months that this stuff was going on, we've only really got the last sort of maybe two or three weeks of the encounters um, recorded in, um, yeah, in, in emails. And uh, mm. as we later find out, some photographs. Um he goes on to say um, that again, f- throughout this three um, this three months, his five year old daughter kept asking him about the kids with no hair, mm. um, and it was only upon sort of further questioning because you know we know you know you and I both know that five year olds they've got quite the imagination and they do quite do, easily yeah. make you know sort of make stuff up. But upon further questioning, he determined that his daughter had actually spent the previous night as well as a few others watching these creatures playing in their uh, front yard Um, Mm. because David also notes to find in his shed door open and a lot of his kids toys kind of strewn across the the lawn yeah Um, and then his daughter later confirms that yeah she saw the little bald kids playing with the, the toys in the front yard so things were starting to yeah kind of it paints, up a the, little bit. it paints an incredible image, doesn't it? Oh, does, if these adjust, are, yeah. if these really are intergalactic species that yeah. travel through space and time and has this incredible technology, and they're riding around on a little Tunker toy out in the yeah, backyard, exactly. and you think, garden toys, yeah, it's sort of something out of scary movie, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah, um, and so yeah, so. Greg is still a little bit dubious at this point. Like I say, it's a long old email, so I have sort of paraphrased, but the, the main 
the main mm. chunk of what the email contains is is basically what I've just gone over. So uh, Greg, who received the email, is still a little bit dubious and, and kind of wants more proof before he would sort of investigate or entertain it anymore, mm. um, which is what he tells to you know David Christie in a, you know in a response. Um, expecting to never hear from him again because he thought, you know, if it's a hoax, he's not going to be able to provide said evidence or or pictures. Um, right. However, days later, um, David Christie then provides another email containing photos, um, which are of uh, footprints that he found in the mud around his property, mm. and these are basically that they're three toed footprints and people have looked at them because greg again th- sort of thought well okay you know i'm not particularly outdoorsy so you know this could yeah, be this from is, what you got to remember is that this essentially is a, a, a cryptozoology case almost it is sent yeah. to a paranormal investigator which exactly is, yeah so he's got the wrong expertise they're kind but... of they're, they're kind of on the same sort of side the paranormal investigators cryptozoology yeah. ufologists and, and such but Oh, there's all cross the point that they make at that first episode in they don't talk to each other. They, no, so a big much investigator clicking. wouldn't talk to a paranormal investigator and they wouldn't talk to a ufologist and, and so on yeah. and so on. But they, they don't all, share their information. No, but they would find a lot of um sort of crossover. Um, it's almost like um, you know, mainstream scientists and their various different uh, yeah. chosen directions <laughs> yeah. are very much on that sort of yeah. wavelength as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Again, they don't like talking topical. to each other, do they? No, they don't. It would, <laughs> it would uh, appear apparent. Yeah. yeah. Um, My science is the best science. Exactly. Biology. Captain science. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can imagine like a, a, a meet up, like uh, like the news, like the news anchors. Meeting up, having a fight, <laughs> yeah. heads of all the sciences. Uh, come <laughs> stars, bitches. <laughs> come stars. Tonight, the streets run red with burgundy's blood. <laughs> you know I watched that last night. Would you believe? You geologist, you're going to get it today. That's it. Yeah. Put you in the ground. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Um, so yeah, he he sort of agrees that there's a, a shared interest, but he doesn't really have the the sort of required expertise. So what he does is he drafts in a couple of people that he knows who are kind of a bit more outdoorsy and you know explore or hike or, or whatever it may be, and he sends these pictures to them and just said, look, what what would you say, you know, sort of about these? What what would you kind of liken it to? And yeah, in their kind of knowledge and in their sort of expert opinion, they couldn't liken it to anything that they've, they, seen tracks like that, that it, they've ever seen. Yeah, and the one thing that yeah. they, the, the the one thing that they mentioned was that if they were to have been faked, then some of the detail in the prints is almost impossible to fake, which is like the derma ridges in the the like in the foot and like the creases in the mm. skin and that kind of thing. They said it can be replicated, but it's very hard to fake and for it to be, you know, sort of convincing. Um, and so they think that they're, they're genuine prints, but they just don't know what from. It's nothing that they've ever mm. seen in the wilderness and it, it isn't anything that is kind of known to be, um, what's the word? Uh, I can't think of the word, but uh, it, it's nothing that's known to be local to, yeah. Kentucky. So, yeah, yeah, okay, I understand. Yeah, so it wouldn't be like, say, like a giant salamander or something like that that we've heard about <laughs> or previously. A cr- or a crane or a barn owl. or Yeah, or a giant like barn that, owl yeah. or a horned owl or something like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, it's, it's something that we've ne- they've never seen in those tracks before. And, you no. know, honestly, those those tracks are quite, they're quite something. Oh, they, they are, know? yeah. We'll, uh, again, we'll share um, images of them on the, the socials once we've... Um, once we've mm. dropped the uh, episode, just so you can kind of see, because they don't look, you know, also they don't look human. They don't look like any animal that that even I would be aware of in my sort of limited knowledge. And mm. these experts couldn't sort of think of anything or even liken it to, oh, it could be, it could be this, but it could just be like a weak impression. I or, think it's because, you know, the, it's the dermal ridges. That's the thing. That's that, the thing. It's the dermal kind of ridges. Got people yeah. really thinking about it is that it's basically the fingerprints, that, like the, the marks that you've got on your hands, you have them yeah. on your feet as well. That you can't so, fake, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So, so someone would be able to track your footprints. Yeah. Like, and, know through, yeah. and know that it's you for, yeah. for forensic means. So yeah, it's the same exactly. sort of thing that, 
it, it's something that's very, very hard to, um, very, very hard to to fake that. Yeah, but basically, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Also, also at the same time, we didn't see any pictures of several footprints walking off in a certain direction. Just see like you just one see or the one, two. Yeah. Yeah, we um, saw. I think you see two, but in different places. Two different, yeah, they're two different footprints. Yeah. Um, and at one point, he does actually put them up against like a um, a ruler, so yeah, a measuring an stick on... at the very least. Yeah. To give yeah, give you an idea as to the sort of size of it. As, well, as, he as says well, he can. But... He says he can put his hand. He he can sort of put his hand in the print, doesn't he? But that doesn't give an idea on on sort of how how much of his hand or or sort of how big the the print is so that because that's one of the things that mm. um, Greg writes back with. He, he once he receives these photos, Greg Newkirk does write back and sort of says, "Look, you know, I'm interested, but I'm still going to want kind of more photos, more evidence, size of the, you know, size of the prints to kind of help put it into, you know, sort of context because it could be it could be belonging to anything as small as a rodent, um, or uh, it could be." Um, like a, a I don't know mountain lion or a big cat or something. So they just need yeah. a bit of a, you know a bit of bit of context. Um, so actually, some time passes um, between communications, and sort of Greg thinks nothing more of it, and sort of thinks, oh, maybe I'd, you know, maybe asking for more evidence was a bit too much. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, I think we're talking a few weeks um, between. Uh, communications but uh, David Christie does uh, get back in touch with uh, Greg to basically apologize for his lack of communication and confirms that him and his family had to vacate the property due to the encounters Mm. Um, uh, and they just couldn't stay there you know it become inhabitable and yeah they they just had to get out of there Um, but he was able to return over I think over two or three days to basically pack up the house David returns to the home uh, and takes more um, photos, two of which he claims to actually be of the creatures themselves. Yeah. Um, which, to be fair, they're quite, I mean, the, in the documentary, they had to enhance them and, you know, add some kind of filters on to kind of make them sort of credible. But you you can see the shape. There is something of, there. There's something there. It's like it's a head, a shoulder, and an arm which makes it look as though the creature is kind of leaning around from behind a tree mm. to kind of look to cut sort of scope out what's going on ahead. So, mm. and it's got like the sort of the, the bulbous head. That's right. You know, the, yeah. The, Cause the, it's the big eyes. The, the description is that they're like pale, silky skin, featureless face with large round black eyes. Yeah. Um, it didn't seem to wear, they didn't seem to wear any clothing or anything like that. And they stood no. around about four foot tall, which, yeah. which is, the reason why this is so prominent to the team was because that description, minus the weird conical ears, yeah. that the uh, Hopkinsville goblins that's the only difference. Yeah. Had, that's the only difference there, and maybe the you know the the yellowy greenish glow that the yeah. that these creatures had. Mm. Um, but I mean, it, potentially, mm. if you think about it like this, if those Hopkinsville goblins were were real, yeah. And they crash landed in that area, and then they suddenly got underground into the Mammoth Cave system, which is yeah, an incredibly vast yeah. system. I mean, we've posted Enormous. maps about it on our social that just show you on previous episodes exactly yeah. how big that cave system is. And it's these creatures vast. have survived in there since 1955. Yeah, supposedly. Then, yeah. yeah, but you know, for yeah. what's that? That's got well, over 50 years at that point. Yeah, exactly. Then, yeah. You know, they then potentially they've got rid of whatever that was. It might not it have been be. ears. It might have been an apparatus that they would. But well, that was one of the theories, worn. wasn't it? To sort of explain mm. the difference. They sort of say, you know, when they because obviously when they first, you know, landed in 1955, it they came out of a, a UFO out of a spaceship. So were yeah. they wearing it was torso, wasn't it? A yeah. Sort of uh, were they wearing sort of headsets of some description? When they first landed, the, which is what the, the family the greenish saw. yellowy glow, a, a byproduct of radiation of some sort that's now worn off yeah. after all that time. Exactly. Whereas now they've been here for so long, they don't need that headgear anymore. And so they've done away with it. And so that was kind of a, a theory that one of the guys had um, to sort of explain the difference in description, because that was literally the only difference. Otherwise, the descriptions from 1955 and 2012 yeah. were pretty much bang on 
you know exactly the you know exactly the same so the um, strangest thing about it as well is that that was the last email that they received from david christie in 2012 wasn't it it was it was the so last um they only received the last three emails total didn't they yeah he does um so that they yes yeah, so there's there's more photos there's a picture as you said there's a picture of the footprint with a measuring stick beside it to give a, an idea on on how big it was um, and then there's also these two photographs which are from the porch of david's property looking out into the surrounding woods and like i say mm. they had to be um uh what's the word like a uh, filtered and you know enhanced enhanced yeah to, to show the the shape but but when they Ooh. once they do it it is compelling. You can see what David is claiming to be, you know, sort of terrorized by. Um, so, and then again, we'll share them on the mm. the socials, but um, basically, yeah, Greg immediately writes back and says like, okay, you know, you've got my attention. Um, and he confirms that they will go to Helia and investigate. And he asks David how they want to do it. Does he want to meet them there? You know, are they okay yeah. to just go down on, on their own? You know, can they go to his property, et cetera, et cetera? Um, but as you as you correctly uh, state, um, there's no more communications. The emails mm. dry up from uh, from David Christie, um, and uh, yeah, and this is this is where they sort of also piece together um, Helia and Hopkinsville um, in in terms of you know sort of simultaneous. Um, you know, encounters, um, although they are at other ends of Kentucky. So it, the stories do heavily rely on the cave system, which interestingly mm. does run from below Hopkinsville right the way up through Kentucky, um, to covering uh, Helia. Yes, yeah, so this is when they piece uh, piece those two um, encounters sort of together kind of properly. Um this is when they then decide from the lack of communications, then decide to sort of do some searches of their own to see if they can track David down uh, and also look into a little bit more um, on this Terry wrist uh, individual. Um, mm. Cause he's, it's not a name that's apparent to the new Kirk. So they don't know where, why he would have made the recommendation or where he would have got the, the, the details from. Yeah. Um, and so they do some, you know, sort of searches. Um, apparently, that Terry Wrist is a mutual friend, and that's why he makes the introduction. But they can't find any kind of note of who he is or any, you know, sort of prior engagement. Um, the only hit that they could ever find on Terry Wrist is in a book by Alan Greenfield by the name of uh, "The Complete Secret Cipher of the Euphonauts. Which mm. interesting, well, blah, 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 which interestingly, I know I will, yeah, at some point. <laughs> which is interestingly a book that you and I have both uh, purchased. Um, we have, yeah. And we're, we're actually going to get stuck into it, ready for the next this, episode. This opened up a whole can of worms for us, didn't it? Oh, didn't it just? Yeah. Oh, it's and, incredible. And seemingly for the for the Newkirks and the the rest yeah. of the team. So we were both fit, very interested in. Uh, you know, getting involved in that as well, in, in, in not just relying on the references that they give in the documentary, but actually reading the source material for ourselves to see whether, you know, what kind of perceptions we get from it and, you know, perspectives and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, and then that, um, so that's, his name is then given as Terry Arrist, which claims, uh, and he claims to have been a, part of a, a ragtag of uh, Vietnam veterans who um, were tasked with um, visiting underground bases in and around these cave systems um, where aliens have set up shop, basically, and he was tasked with going in and wiping them out. And, oh, the mobile uh, infantry. Eh? Basically, yeah, yeah. Going in there, wiping out the bug hole. <laughs> yeah, pretty, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> want to know more? <laughs> yeah, 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 do you want to know more? <laughs> um and yeah so yeah basically it's where they believe that uh, extraterrestrials had set up shop in these cave systems and yeah these Viet why Viet vietnam vets maybe because i don't know jungle warfare caves and i don't know i don't know where the relevance is there but yeah basically they were i guess it would have been that that period of the time i guess that, that period as well you're right yeah just after mm. the 40s yeah i guess so yeah so they were tasked with going in and, and clearing them out and so this is where terry wrists uh involvement um kind of uh, stems from um now 
just sort of quickly, I guess, just because for again for good old synchronicities. Um, back in, well, they get Ob- contacted by him, don't they? This is a strange thing. They well, they do. Yeah, mm. they they do. And this um, is where the synchronicities start happening and start well, picking up again. Yeah, exactly. I mean, just prior, just prior to that, um, just prior to that communication, um, and we're still in 2012, but we're now in October, so late later on, mm. sort of in the year. Um, they've basically forgotten about David Christie and Terry Wrist, and they've moved on to another project, um, which takes them to the Brown Mountains, and uh, along with a friend of theirs, um, uh, a guy called Mika. Um, Mika Hanks, um, they go and uh, investigate the Brown Mountains. Now, the reason why they take their friend Mika Hanks with them is because he claims to have had a conversation or interaction with a psychic who tells him that there is a an entrance to a cave within the Brown Mountains. Um, and knowing the Newkirk's involvement with this goblin stuff, he Mm. mentions it to them and so offers to take them out um, to these coordinates that he basically gets given by the the psychic. Well, Um, Brown Mountain is a incredibly, it it was a hotspot for UFO activity. Um, You know, it's, it's a place where loads of people go to because there are lights. It's Mm. Brown Mountain is a really, really strange structure in that, it almost looks like just this standalone one mountain by itself. Yeah. With sort of like a plateau on the top of it. Yeah. So it just kind of like like a viewing like point just, almost. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. And but there's always lights going in and yeah. out of it. You know, yeah. that people are seeing going up into the sky, going into yeah. the mountain. It's a really, really strange place. Yeah. Even even a local celebrity to us, good old Danny fucking Dyer, who went out oh, there and yeah, uh, I remember you saying. spotted some fucking U- I saw UFO, didn't I? Fucking did me fucking nothing, didn't it? You know, that like, knocked him out, didn't I, son? Yeah, yeah, did you know, sort of, you know, you know, fucking nutted him, didn't I? Didn't <laughs> Clever bollocks, me, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, yeah, so that's exactly. the reason why they but were yeah. in Bre- while they were well, at Brown Mountain. They went there also. Because it's a UFO hotspot, they're predominantly, or by trade, they're UFO investigators. And um, it, the, as you say, the activity is that prominent there that they actually, I think it was Dana that commented, they actually went there expecting to be abducted or to have a, yeah, an interaction because be it's that prominent. It. Yeah, if you're going to do it, this is where you're going to, you know, this is where you're going to go and this is where it's going to happen. Um, so anyway, Mika, Hanks that takes them to these coordinates, um, takes them into the actual cave entrance um, as far as they can until they get to a point where the entrance is blocked. And lo and behold, it is blocked by a you know giant slab of rock, which to the rest of the mountain, surprisingly, did seem out of place. It seemed like it had been mm. kind of rolled into place or, or slotted like into from, place deliberately like from the outside. to... Yeah, well, from the outside. The thing. It, it, didn't, it wasn't like it had fallen down from the hadn't, inside. No, it hadn't fallen or anything like that. It had been, yeah, it had been put there. Now, whether it had been pushed in or rolled in or however, but it did mm. look out of place and it did look like it was blocking the entrance. It was stopping yeah. people from venturing in um, further. So they do, obviously, a, you know, an investigation around the slab, try and see if they can get in, you know, sort of what vibes they're getting from it and you know, and that kind of thing. Um, and obviously don't come up with, with anything, but it, it kind of helps confirm that, yes, there are, you know, cave systems. Yes, there are entrances dotting around and they are in and around area, which is which are hives of activity, um, you know, for this kind of phenomena. So, mm. so yeah, so what they do is they they, they return home from this trip to, um, you know, the, the, the Brown Mountains and uh, as you rightly said earlier, they come home to an email from none other than Terry Wrist himself. Now, mm-hmm. this is where it starts the an, another um, synchronicity, um, you know, and quite a compelling one, I would say, um, because the email simply said, why did you stop when you were so close? Question mark. I have something for you one week. 
signed now, wrist. Yeah, signed, and then, and then it was signed wrist, as you as you say. Mm. Now there was now that the Newkirk saying the documentary that there was only probably three people, possibly four people that knew they were going to the Brown Mountains. Mm. Obviously, Greg and Dana Newkirk, um, Mika um, Hanks. And they said possibly one other person knew about it. Other than that, no one knew that they were going to the Brown Mountains. And then to come home to that email from someone who's only been name dropped in communications, they've not heard from yeah. this person yet. And then they get this email saying, why did you stop when you were so close? Well, one could say that actually them being at Brown Mountain was the synchronicity. That it's yeah. in itself, them being there and mm. investigating this, um, or even hearing about from their the, from their friend uh, Mika that there was a, a potential underground base there that he'd been given coordinates for yeah. that in itself. Them hearing about that and saying, "Yeah, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll go along to that." That in itself would be the yeah. synchronicity. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, clearly, right. someone was watching them, watching their movements. This yeah. Terry Wrist or whoever it yeah. is was watching them and asking them why did they stop when they were so close. Well, and it makes you wonder. Like, I don't know. I mean that in itself that just gives me chills. Like it they, did, were, they yeah. could have been right on the fucking doorstep. Like yeah, they could literally have been where they needed to be at that point. And but it sort of leads you to believe, you know, or think. Sorry, you know, was Terry Wrist or the person going by that name? Were they mm. the psychic that reached out to Micah Hanks? Exactly. To to, it, to to then be able to know that they were there at you know at that particular well, that's, point. Or... That's the strange thing. Is it just a coincidence? In, or, yeah. Well, as we, know, as is we there know, any yeah. such thing as coincidence, or is it all yeah. by design? Is it yeah. by someone's design? Yeah. And this or is just another is it just thread by the design of the fucking universe or something. <laughs> yeah, like yeah that? exactly. No. Um, yeah. So they they receive that email. There's nothing more in it. They obviously think it's weird. They then they scramble together to try and think right. Well, how the hell they they like reply that. Like, who is this? That's it. Like, yeah. like, like you would. You'd yeah, go, as you would. Yeah. Who are you? you? Sort of thing, yeah. Like, but they don't get anything until, you know, as promised, a week later, they receive mm. another email from Terry Wrist that reads, um, Helia was just a symptom. The ink and black are isolated still and third order MIA. Uh, bear in mind, for every door closed, a window must be opened. The door is closed. The window is open. Use the numbers. And I was, I was like, what the fuck? I was like, what? No, it just, but what's just really exploded, weird about this but... is that uh, you get to see um, like a screenshot of the email. Uh, that's that your emails. Was yeah. I was going to come on to uh, that. Yeah. It's They're all lowercase. All lowercase. Lower There's case, odd yeah. spacing. Yeah, so some of the words will be broken. So Helia is broken up into two words i think he writes yeah. h e double l i and then there's a space and then it has the e r and even window as well the first window, window yeah. that was written is wind and o w yeah. o or o w yeah and then use the numbers number and s are separated so yeah. is it deliberate it, or it's some weird enigma sort of yeah. code thing that's going on now is it some like that... ai thing that's uh some AI thing that's doing it, maybe. Or well, this is what I don't, know, this but... is, I don't know about you, but this is kind of the bit what prompted me to buy that fucking book and go, What yeah. the hell is this? Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. There's, there's, there's some sort of code here, it's some sort of cipher of the UFO noughts that's going on. It was the cipher, um, well, it's the, it was the cipher bit, and we'll, we'll come on to it a bit later. Yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil it now, but uh, it was, it was what happens later on in the season that made me want to buy um want to buy the book but yeah this is certainly um you know a part of it um now it's interesting this... sorry go on. yeah yeah go go no go go on because i think i know what you're gonna say all right about it's, this bit. i was to say it's, it's interesting to note that the new kirks at this point hadn't shared with anyone that they were investigating hellier and that they'd received mm. these emails from david christie so how would this Terry Wrist have known that? He, you know, he shouldn't have known that. Now we know that he supposedly put David Christie in contact with the New Kirks, but we don't at this point know whether Terry Wrist knew why he wanted to get in touch, and so we don't really know what his involvement was. But there's nothing yeah. to suggest that he would have known that they were investigating Helia to prompt him to mention that in his, you know, following, um, you know, email. So that was. Um, yeah, so that was really 
interesting. Now, the email this time actually came with an attachment, um, which was a, a tattered bit of paper that just had numbers scrawled on it. And again, you know, didn't really mean anything to Greg or Dana. So again, they reached out to their Facebook group uh, and to, to sort of friends to ask what the hell do these numbers mean? Now, a few things were, you know, kind of banded around as as possible um, mm. uh, theories as to what the like numbers a, were. Like a credit card number or... Yeah, the first thing was a, a credit, credit card, card number. Like uh, but mm. then someone came and said, no, like they're, they're coordinates. And so yeah. Greg then searches the numbers as though they were coordinates and the pin is dropped right on the cave entrance that they'd visited in the Brown Mountains. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah, I know. Only days before. So it's just like, what? And it was on a tattered old bit of bit of paper. It had a, yeah. it had another word written on it. Um, but so it, it didn't look like it was particularly kind of new. It looked like it had sort of been used, you know, prior, almost in years prior, because it really did look, yeah. you know, like, you know, back in school when you wanted to look, make a, make a letter look old you used to rub a tea bag on it that's right <laughs> and, and, and then like burn the edges put, put it in the oven a little bit yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. look like that yeah. <laughs> parchments there's a yeah, parchments, that's yeah. make it look exactly. like parchment exactly right so that's yeah, what it doing an old egyptian of. scroll today mum <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah that's it so um yeah so um they, 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 they never heard back from David Christie or Terry Wrist again after this point. Um, they tried reaching out to, you know, they even tried reaching out to the family involved in the Hopkinsville incident, but they, they, they were adamant they didn't want to be interviewed because they received yeah. so much uh, ridicule um, around the time they first came out with the story that they just didn't want to, you know, kind of go through it again. Um, they, they tried looking into a sort of other encounters and, other um you know reports of similar things but nothing really came out as being particularly substantial so everything was really kind of centered around Helia Hopkinsville mm. and these two individuals David Christie and uh you know and Terry Wrist um so and this is like what we were saying they this is where they also find out that well they find out about the mammoth cave system and the fact that it runs right below Kentucky um, from Hopkinsville um, to Hellier and even right up to the Appalachians. So, you know, mm. good, it's a good old West Virginia well, is it's, uh, it's on all, top of it as well. It's all in the Appalachian Mountains, all of it. Yeah, so exactly, it does yeah. run all the way up through to Point Pleasant and yeah, uh, Flatwoods yeah. as well. Yeah, absolutely, and yeah. Uh, what's really, right. really interesting is that they were later on, they were filming this, this um, or like a monster hunt sort of documentary and, um, in, in and around that same area and this little girl as they were wrapping up they were just filming some b-roll for like the yeah. the goblin story and, and whatnot and right. uh, this yeah. little girl comes over to them and says are you monster hunters and they say well yeah you know yeah we're monster hunters have you seen anything strange around here she goes actually yeah we have uh we've, we've seen some weird little little creatures around here and like coming and out of the caves yeah. Stay, yeah coming out of the caves and they go yeah. what she, sorry, yeah. what? Um, and they ask her like in a roundabout way to go back and forth with this little girl, and and they ask her like, "Can you draw what you saw?" And she starts off by drawing a three-toed foot, yeah, which is really really weird. Yeah, it's because... quite odd for a child to want to draw that specifically, um, yeah. and to know. And and when you look at the drawing, it's exactly the same as the footprint in the photo provided yeah, by shape. David Christie. Shape, yeah. Same yeah. bulb, and this is bulbous toes, and so that tells me. I don't know about if it tells you, but it tells mm. me that when they said draw what you've seen, mm. so she's seen a lot of footprints. Yeah, that's that's what comes to my mind. The fact that she's drawn that first, she goes, about to remember oh, it. Yeah. I've seen that all the time, and I know what that is. And then she draws a big round head, bobble eyes, and pointy ears. Yeah, yeah. So, which again, again is almost bang on to what had been described in Hopkinsville and by yeah. David Christie. And interestingly, just for those listeners that might be thinking, well, that's a bit, bit convenient. They, yeah. the, the new Kirks did look around at the production company to think, right, who's winding us up here? Cause yeah, this, someone's this, is all, us on. this is all a little too, you know, sort of convenient. Um, but a little bit coincidental. Absolutely. Some might say, <laughs> some might say. Um, <laughs> and but yeah, there's no one interested. There's no one kind of paying attention. The crew are busy packing down their equipment 
um, you know, ready to kind of end the shoot and, you know, sort of go home. So, well, this is where yeah. they also start um, realizing the importance of synchronicities um, because yes. they're experiencing all of these various different co- uh, coincidences that they actually start looking into the idea of what a synchronicity is. And obviously, that brings up uh, the great researcher, John Keel. Absolutely. And yeah. You, obviously, that with Helia's proximity to Point Pleasant as well, it's only about 150 miles as the crow flies. Yeah, um, I think we worked it out as like a three to three and a half hour drive from yeah. Helia to Point Pleasant. So it, all of this weird, high strangeness seems to be happening. Um, and you mentioned earlier that they found the, um, that, that Terry Rist was in this book, The Secret um, Cipher of the Euphonauts. And it's an interview in the back that is really quite prominent. And that's right. I think this is the reason why we've, we've both ordered this book and we're going to give this a real good read because there yeah. is the, there is a cipher that you have to learn to then apply to what is being said in this transcript now that's right this is now the, the the cipher itself is supposedly from an ultra terrestrial that was channeled by um alistair crowley the, <laughs> yeah. the most wicked man to yeah. ever existed yeah. um self self-named by the way yeah um self-claimed yeah the, yeah, and it was supposedly channeled in the 1920s in Egypt. That's right. um, and I think I might know what actually happened in that <laughs> in that ritual in which he channeled this this yeah. cipher. Um, and it's 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 quite a graphic one, ladies and gentlemen. So yeah. cover the children's ears. Um, it basically mm-hmm. it involved a lot of sodomy, right? Um, because he was. Uh, Alistair Crowley was known as um, a power bottom. Um, so he, even though he was a bottom within uh, homosexual acts, he yeah. was most definitely the dominant of the two. Right. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to make of that. No, that's, yeah. uh, that's something that I did find out with regards to that. He took his, um, his apprentice along with him to Egypt in which they conducted this ceremony in this uh uh, this this invocation um his uh his apprentice later left not soon after not you know not too soon Funny after enough, that yeah. Funny enough, yeah. yeah you know having th- yeah. made him made his apprentice bum him in yeah. order to, ch- to channel this ultra terrestrial yeah through occult means is uh, yeah. yeah that's um that's a new I'll one let him crack on with that yeah. one yeah, we'll just yeah. read the cipher we ain't they'll, getting they'll involved try. in that one yeah, exactly. But they'll, yeah. they'll try. So if you, yes, okay. If you say, right, do you fancy a trip to Egypt next week? Fuck off, mate. <laughs> it ain't happening. Right. So Thanks anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just want to throw that out there, right? Yeah. You know, just just so you know that, yeah. yeah we, so we're that. on the same page right now, can yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Now I know. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so what's really interesting is um, within this, within this transcript, within this interview. Mm. Um, a subject of one of our previous episodes comes up, Indrid Cold. There, the man himself. Yeah. Well, well this, this is, is actually, this is where, um, this is where uh, Connor Randall um, and Rashad Caesarmore are introduced to the group, uh, and, and you know, kind of their part. So Rashad is the videographer, Connor's the paranormal investigator, um, and they've decided that they're going to pack up and they're going to go down to um, Helia, basically. And it's actually Carl who is reading the book by Alan Greenfield, The Secret Cipher of the Euphonauts. Unif- U- and um, it's about a five hour drive. So he thinks, well, I'll, I'll read through it and, you know, I'll see what, see what I get. Now it's actually in a hard file that Greg has put together that Carl is reading and he finds printouts of the, um, uh, the, the, the sort of the transcript from the interview uh, between Alan and Terry Rist um and yeah there's a there's a few things uh that you references in the in the cipher um mm. did you want to cover them off i mean i've obviously i've got them yeah here, sure but... well this is the thing right so i'll read you out a little bit of um so apparently terry wrist actually met uh indrid cold and um so i'll just pick it up from the transcript here really and i'm not going to go too much into it because like in the interest of time but um so greenfield asks uh so you just walked up to the door, Rish says. A guy 
uh, with one big difference from the descriptions, walks up like he'd been waiting. I didn't knock and I said, Mr. Cold, I presume. He smiled and said, my friends call me Indred. And Greenfield said, let me guess, he was a black guy. The blondes can be black. So the blondes is a reference to um, what the Lanulosans supposedly were. Yeah. Um, and Terry Reese says the blondes is a conceit started by Adamski and uh, Rick Williamson. And they have the same racial features and range as we do. To Derenberger, he didn't appear as a black guy, did he? No, he didn't. No. No. And um, in the in the interest of security, Rick Williamson, I guess, believed that the Nordic Aryan race crap from the Nazis, how did you guess? So he's asking mm. Greenfield, how did you guess? And Greenfield says, well, 112 equals ink and black. Mm. So it's just a guess. Yeah. So ink and black is, yeah. a, ref- is a referring to Indrid Cold. Yeah. So when we look back on the email... That from Terry Wrist, yeah. From Terry Wrist, it goes, the ink and black are isolated in the third order MIA. Yeah. So he's talking about injured cold. Injured, injured cold, cold. He's still on Earth. It's featured in that email. Yeah. He's still on Earth. And he's isolated. And he's, he's still waiting. He's isolated. He's waiting to be contacted. Yeah. That's absolutely like, it. No, that's absolutely it. Yeah. What the fuck is going on? Yeah. Like, yeah. even now, I'm not even involved in this investigation. I'm feeling, feeling like, what on Earth? What's going on. Yeah. Um, yeah, no. So as we said at the start, you know, this trip is no longer just about a goblin hunt, you know, anymore. Right. There's now so much more to this case with links to, as we say, both, you know, the Mothman phenomena and, uh, you know, and uh, injured cold. Um, and yeah, it's just, uh, it's, it's interesting. I mean, that they, yeah, so Carl um, finds all of these connections, synchronicities or whatever, reading the cipher obviously claws back to the emails received by Terry Wrist um, mm. and and says, like, Incom, Incom Black. Incom, like, Incom Black is injured cold. Injured cold is still in isolation. He's still, like, on Earth. Like, mm. how does he get involved in all this? So they, they, they pull into Hellier that night, um, and they I think they were due to meet with a contact that they had made when Greg and Dana had, I think, visited for a day a couple of years prior um, right, but she was yeah. unavailable, so Cole just goes over kind of what he managed to crack from this cipher, um, and you know the the connections that he was able to, you know, make. They they bump into you know various locals who, you know, kind of um, are quite uh, unapproachable on the subject. I think for the most part, you know, they don't they claim to have not heard of any phenomena. They oh, you know, the locals. The locals at the at the gas yeah. station when they first pull it first pull in, they sort of like you know we've not seen anything, we've not heard anything, you know, I, you know I don't believe in all that, I, you know. I think one of them comments on the fact that, you know, he doesn't even believe that we've been on the moon and all this stuff. So <laughs> yeah. they, they they completely yeah. you know throw it all out and just like no, you know, it's all it's all rubbish. You know, one of them is particularly threatening to the group and sort of says, you know, you want to watch yourselves around here and, you know, you want to be careful. Yeah, see, I, I took that more as a warning than than yeah. a threat. Well, you know, like yeah. uh, it was like a, you, you know, you just want to be careful of who you trust around it these was, parts. And well, that came second, didn't it? So he was, he, he said, mm. he said, you guys just want to watch yourselves. Left it like as that walked off, and then presumably to his car because then he, he then pulls up beside them, and and, and he's in, in bit more of a, a kind of um, bit more of an approachable uh, tone. He then says to the guys, you know, look, you know, you just want to be careful you know, who you trust around here, you know, folks around here aren't, you know, sort of particularly friendly. You know, if someone, you know, if someone tells you to follow them somewhere because they've found something, basically don't follow them, you know, just be careful who you trust. And that So then, so that becomes Don't take a wrong turn, Sunshine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that becomes more of a warning. But I think initially the interaction was more, you know, sort of threatening because maybe they didn't know how, you know, sort of reckon the team would take it. That sort of thing. They don't like out, out, you know, out of towners. So um, we get we get that in in the British countryside as well. You know, they just yeah, they just, exactly, yeah. they just don't like Europe. outsiders. You, you yeah, exactly. From around yeah. Here. You just have local me. people, local people, the local shop for local people. <laughs> 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 well, no trouble here. No trouble here. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, so they have the, the, this interaction. They, they can't get their contact. They speak to a few locals who kind of basically tell them to sort of forget what they're doing. It's all nonsense, yada, yada, yada. Um, so the next day, they're, they're sitting around their motel room um, Dana Newkirk, as you referenced earlier, is, is a practicing witch of, of sorts. Um, and yeah, she starts to do a, a tarot reading. Uh, she does a, a spread mm. with uh, with Greg, and you know, sort of pulls out uh, you know, sort of various um, various cards. Um, and did go they were doing it, that bit, to... and you couldn't see what cards it was that she drew. She drew the. You see the first one but they don't say she doesn't say what the card was she mm. just tells you what it means then they draw a second one but you don't see it and then they and then greg draws the third one because because he's like oh maybe i should just go with whatever card i'm drawn to and then he drops one on his lap and he's like oh maybe that should be the card then and then he picks it up and mm. gives it to dana and i think that's the devil card but the other two yeah. you don't really you don't really find out you know kind of what they are but the, the purpose for them doing it is and this is what Dana believes, um, is that they want to plan their weekend and they want to set their intention for the weekend. So, mm. you know, this is why we're here. This is what we want to do. You know, we mean no harm, yada, yada, yada. So this is where she gets the power from the, the tarot reading. Um, it's quite an interesting read. Um, and it does kind of pull together a lot of elements of what the kind of the group is thinking, either as a group or as individuals in terms of, you know, what their intention is, you know, how the information has brought them to Helio and how it's a bit muddled mm. and, you know, how they've got all these different, you know, sort of threads that they can, you know, they can pull. Um, I know you're a little bit more, well, very, very clued up on tarot compared to myself. So I'm not yeah. going to try and go into kind of, the power of it or the point of it i mean i'm no i mean i'll to be honest i'll talk about that bit a little yeah. bit later on because the tarot reading comes up again it does come up two i think yeah, two other times rather, so yeah we rather than going over yeah. it a couple of times we'll just yeah, save it for the end time, i think okay. i'll save it for a little bit later yeah. on yeah. okay yeah that makes sense yeah so they so they do that it sets their intention they get quite an interesting read um and so yeah they they continue on with their their day um, again, they try to interact with locals, whether it be local media stations or media outlets like radio stations, that kind of thing. They even try contacting local law enforcement for any reports that may have been logged by locals, that kind of thing. Um, as you would expect, much like the local residents, no one was interested to help. Uh, calls weren't returned and they were just generally not taken seriously. And I kind of got the impression they were sort of seen as a bit of a nuisance and they would rather that they weren't there sort of thing. That was kind yeah. of the impression that I got. Um, so, Testy yeah, they, kids, they didn't... Eh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> me, 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 Turned up kids. in the mystery, the mystery mobile. M mystery, yeah, <laughs> Raggy. <laughs> um, when they... Uh, yeah, they basically they come up with no leads. So what they do is they claw back to a, a kind of a, a feeling that Dana Newkirk got when her and Greg first visited Hellier a couple of years back when they, she felt that she had found David Christie's home. Now, there was nothing to suggest evidence-wise that they'd found it by, a, you know, an address or actually someone telling them, yeah, the guy lived there for only seven months, whatever. It was just a feeling. Now, they'd done a whole scope of the town. They drove past plenty of houses, plenty of locations, but this one in particular gave her the feeling that that's where these in encounters happened. You know, mm. it, it had a front porch like it did in the, the description. Yeah, like the, she it had a, a shed. It had a shed in the right direction. There were not so much kids' toys, but there were items kind of strewn across the front lawn. It looked like whoever lived there just upped and left in the middle of actually living there. And it was, yeah, yeah. like you say, it was a feeling that drew her to this property. So what they decided to do was basically drive around Helia to, mm. to find this house again. And on the basis that it was still unoccupied, probably go in and uh, investigate. They drove... based, based on Dana being a practicing witch as well, she's yes. very much in touch with um, like the feelings and gut instinct that you get and such. And yeah. she says that the entire time that they were in Helia, she says just, there's just this weird vibe that she can't she put felt her finger on. Yeah, yeah, she just felt uncomfortable the entire yeah. time. And it's not just like being around like the no. the, the Kentucky calls or anything yeah. like that. It's 
it's just the area itself just had a strange vibe, a strange energy about it that she just wasn't a hundred percent comfortable with. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah. that 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 remains evident all the way through that. This all the way through the season, well. yeah. And it's also corroborated by uh, Connor as well, the the paranormal investigator. He he latches on to a lot of those um, uneasy mm-hmm. feelings as well. And he sort of says that he, like, because I think the comment he makes when they do the tarot card that morning, the, the tarot read, sorry, that morning, is that he says it, it was an uncomfortable read for an uncomfortable situation, you know, uh, yes. which was a reflection yeah. of how he felt as soon as they entered Hellier. So it was a shared feeling amongst the group. So it was, yeah, as you say, it was definitely a vibe. Um, now, that, like I said, they, they drive the whole breadth of this town couldn't find anything. Right. And uh, they, um, they, yeah, couldn't, couldn't find anything. And so they just try and talk to more locals. They literally driving down the road, see, see a couple of guys, they pull over and ask, you know, about what they've sort of seen. Um, and yeah, again, there's nothing really of any real they substance. They don't really find much out about, but by getting boots on the ground and going and having a look, they don't yeah, seem to find out they much. They find nothing, because yeah. No one seems to really want to talk to them. No one seems no. to know who David Christie is. No one heard um, of David Christie, yeah. They've and it shown people like... a couple of photos of these footprints as well and gone, oh, well, that, you know, that looks like, like cold slurry, slurry. Yeah. Um, which is what you'd get from um, a mine that's, that's um, flooded, basically. Well, that's what they and used to just, do. To it's overflowed people. and it's just come straight out. Once the mining had stopped in that town, what they did was they basically flooded the caves or the mines, sorry, to stop people going in, uh, to you know, stop people obviously, you know, going in and dying or whatever. So what they would do is they would flood the the tunnels for that sort of purpose and then block the entrances. Um, but what they said would happen is because of it being underground, because of it being mixed with like the coal and with the entrances being blocked, it would build up a pressure within the tunnel system and eventually the entrances would burst leaking all of this uh slurry um, mm. everywhere and so yes yeah, to the, the the best lead they got was that these two guys sort of said yeah it looks like coal slurry but then when they asked mm. whether there was anywhere in the area concentrated enough to have the slurry they were like oh no it will be all around the town it could be anywhere everyone's got a cave on their property and then they're like oh <laughs> so it's just another kind of dead end but it almost gave them that glimmer of uh you know that that glimmer of hope. So, yeah, boots on the ground. They they come up with pretty much nothing. Certainly nothing compelling from considering how long they spent there and how many people they, you know, got in touch with. Um, they then decide at the end of that day to stay outside of Helia um, in a little town called Jenkins. Um, mm. Now they're staying in a, a little lodge that's kind of a mount amongst the the mountain range and a load of dense. Um, woodland which is where you would expect kind of any creatures to be so i think that's why they picked the area um in particular and they basically go out for a walk um to to sort of investigate the woods and the the area and to see what they can kind of come up with um now this is where again dana comes into her own a little bit um and they set their intention for why they're out in the woods and and why they're gonna and what they want to achieve from it and so again, mm. she, she projects she, the intention of communication, really, isn't yes. it? She's yeah. looking to open up lines of communication between them and yeah. the goblins, you know, or whatever yeah, exactly. it is that's out there. Or whatever is out there, absolutely right. So she makes an offering of uh, tobacco whilst burning candles. And this is to basically, th- this is kind of like a, it's done out of respect. It's to show that they're there with good intentions. They've made this offering you know, it, you know, we come in peace almost. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Take and, me to your uh, dealer. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it, it helps set the intention of what they want to achieve, as I say, and, and how they want to communicate. Um, now, Connor, um, which is where he his involvement really kind of starts, is he basically states that they have good intentions and they're happy to communicate with anything that wants to communicate back as long as it is on those terms. Mm. Um they once they make their intentions they start hearing various noises like wood knocking which is synonymous with you know bigfoot encounters the big guy himself the big guy himself they hear various noises but not like the kind of the whooping or you know the sort of the call of a a sort of a bigfoot it's more like kind of a chirping or a yeah they hear a weird chirping i I, I don't want to say it but it's some of it sound like hooting 
like a, an owl. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, it could very well have been great horned owls. In I fact. don't want to don't draw that comparison for obvious reasons, <laughs> but uh, yeah, and also as you'd expect, rustling. So you know, yeah. trees, branches snapping, typical sort of thing that you'd find if someone's skulking around. Um, there's nothing much else in the way of interaction. So they've made their offering. They've sort of made their peace. They retreat back to um, the porch of their cabin. Um, and Connor decides to carry out a spirit box um, experiment, um, mm. which is different to anything I had um, usually seen. And it basically involved... So spirit box, for anyone who doesn't know, is basically like a FM, AM sort of radio device that basically just scans the way, the way, radio waves. Um, mm. And, but, but like very quickly to sort of. Yeah, just cycles forth, through the, the FM frequency yeah. over and over and over. And it, it kind yeah. of opens up a, yeah, uh, a way of communicating with anything that might be on a different wave to us, basically. Uh, and so to block out any other interferences he wears noise cancelling headphones and also a, a, an eye mask so he can't mm. see anything that might you know interfere with what he's you know kind of doing and also just the the headphones so all he yeah, can so hear like, he, is he the can't react he can't react yeah. to the rest of the team or anything like that because no because they're asking you can, questions. you can take visual yeah. visual cues and, and yeah. things like this can't you and yeah and there's a lot of visual cues that, that end up happening in this, a this lot. interaction a lot. I mean, yeah i mean we're not going to detail all of it because it's really no. worth watching it yeah um, watch it for that watching it and go back and have reason, a look at it. yeah we'll share a link um, to to the the season um, and yeah. kind of where we can on the on the socials just so people can kind of jump in because yeah there's there's a lot as you probably guessed that we're paraphrasing and kind of running over quite quickly in the interest of time in the interest well, of time really. otherwise you could yeah you could quite easily do four or five hours just going mm. through each detail you know in its own sort of merit but uh but to, to but to put to put this session into a nutshell um with connor in this double blind spirit box yeah. um situation He's having a back and forth conversation, really, with the team. Um, or he's at in least theory, he's communicating in, he's... with something that's out in the woods. The, yeah, the, the group are asking questions. The answers are coming to Connor directly via this uh, uh, spirit box. And a couple of things happened during it, which I thought were quite interesting. So Dana Newkirk, you can see, hears a noise from kind of beyond the porch, so in the darkness, in in the in the trees, and she sort of looks at the camera and points. And just as she points, yeah. Connor says, there. Right there, isn't it? There, there yeah. right there, Mothman. That's and, right. Uh, and then they're all like, Mothman? What? what the like, and that, like, they're completely like shocked by it. Um, and yeah, he basically, so he relays other words via that way of, you know, sort of communication. Um, and other words that he comes out with basically indicate that the group are going to meet with whoever Connor is communicating with mm. in a cave in the hills. Now, there's no exact location. There's no, um, you know, kind of coordinates or like or, or anything given to kind of indicate where in the hills. But but what he basically throws out is, yeah, it's basically words that will indicate that, that the group mm. will go to the cave uh, within the hills and they'll meet again with whoever Connor is communicating with, you know, at that, um, you know, at that precise uh, moment. Um, the voice also seemed to attach itself to Carl because a couple of times Carl did something and Connor would then say, um, I think at one time Carl went to sit down and he, he sort of, he trips or he sort of falls onto his backside. See, yeah, and Connor but... says, Carl, be careful. That's right, yeah. Just as he fell down, and then he go, he, uh, the battery dies on his camera. So Cole goes into the cabin to get, presumably, to get a new battery, and then the voice communicates to Connor, um, Cole gone, yeah, and stuff like that. So there's a few little things like that, and it, so it seemed to attach itself to um, to it's Cole, very, which I very was odd. quite interesting, yeah, because there's no real rhyme or reason for it to to kind of no. do that when you consider the Dana's the practicing witch. And Carl is the yes. uh, sorry, Connor is the paranormal investigator, which I know mm. Carl is as well. But Carl was there more as the producer of the show, whereas yeah. Connor was specifically 
the paranormal. He guy. conducts the actual but, inspect yeah. experiments and such. And I think yeah. I think uh, Connor sir, Connor at this point has done hundreds of spirit box sessions in this particular manner as well. So he's yeah. very well versed and he's very he's in tune he's very with, good at being uh, able to get into the right state of mind to be able to conduct very good, these yeah. sort of experiments. Yeah, I do what like I thought Connor, was really yeah. quite interesting as well was later on in in the chat. Yeah, um, Connor says the girl is ready. That's after they say about meeting at this cave. Yeah, yeah. They, they, so they he say, says the he girl says ready. is ready. He says ready, and then Greg's like, yeah, I'm ready. And he says, ready. The girl is ready. And he says, who's ready? And then he says, the girl is ready. And they're like, yeah. what? Obviously, they're referring to Dana there as well. Yeah. Because I think she's certainly, in the, in the the with, with regards to her witchcraft practices and, and such, yeah. she's probably in the right frame of mind. Yeah, exactly. To be yeah. able to communicate. Well, with these sort of things, and it depends. Yeah, they could be talking one about one thing that does prop up. Yeah, sorry, go on, go on, go on. You say, go on, I, I, I was, was, was going to say that you know, they by saying the girl is ready, they could be obviously referring to um Dana, obviously being the only girl in the group. But as we later, you know, sort of find out in the season, they do also possibly communicate with a, a young, girl? with yeah. a young girl. So, it, oh, that it, didn't even crop. That yeah, even, so it could have yeah. a, it could have a double even think about that. double sort of potential meaning there. But yeah, a couple of other words come out. Like Connor says, "Record it." Just as Carl hears a noise over in the trees, he shines his torchlight on the trees, and then Connor says, "There again." And then, as they sort of all walk over towards the end of the porch and look in that direction, Connor, via this voice, then says, "Record it." Yeah. They all walk closer to investigate the noise and to see if they can identify where it is and and kind of where it's coming from, um, but they don't see anything or, or kind of hear anything more. Anything. But there was enough there to suggest that whatever it was Connor was talking to was watching them from mm. only kind of the edge of the property, which was probably only maybe twelve to fifteen feet from the porch. It wasn't yeah. a it wasn't a big uh, like I think it was a backyard. It wasn't particularly big. From, yeah, it's just from kind like, of a, where like they... a rental cabin sort of thing. It's not. Yeah, exactly. And it was a tree line. Or anything like that. No, 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 no. So, um, yeah. So basically, they end um, the session. And... But there's so before they do end end the session, there's a couple more things that are really quite important that don't seem important at this point, okay. but do become important later on. And Connor says forty eight minutes. Um, yeah. which in itself yeah. you go mm, it's nothing right, okay, really 48 yeah. minutes so then then they check their cameras and they okay they've actually been recording for a lot longer than that so that was yeah. weird right whatever so they move on yeah um and then toward the end of the session connor receives an image in his mind and this mm. is the first time in all of the spirit box set spirit box sessions that he's done yeah he's never had an image come to his mind and this one was no. so incredibly clear yeah that it was like he could reach out and grab it. Yeah, it was like and, he said it was like it was floating in front of his face. It was that vivid. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it, yeah, he said it was just right there, right in his mind. Yeah. And it was just so incredibly vivid. And it, again, it seems so unassuming and so like, what the fuck was that supposed to mean? Yeah. But it was a tin can, a nondescript, blank tin can tin with no can. label, a yeah. couple of dents on it. Yeah. You know, th that's it. That's and it. And he's just yeah. like, and he, he doesn't understand the, the relevance of it. So he just says, I don't know why, but I've just got this uh, tin can in my head. Yeah. I don't know what that's about, but it's never, it's never had this before, but yeah. Yeah. But it was interesting. And, um, and yeah, it was I suppose it's worth... sitting there in this blank space. It was just. Yeah, exactly. And it was at that point that I finally kind of understood all the jokes that the NAC guys made. Yeah. Because for anyone yeah, that doesn't... you had no idea before. I had no you? idea. It made no sense to me because I hadn't seen it at this point. But um, for anyone, you know, out there, our um, our good friends, the, the boys in uh, Not Another Conspiracy uh, podcast, they've already done uh, their own take on the Helia documentary, um, which is really funny, actually. So if you're yeah, enjoying it's a good episode, that... so if you're enjoying this go and uh you know go and check theirs out it, it, you know it is good but it it was at that point when he when he says it and i was like oh the tin can, the tin right. can. now i get yes. it it all get, it made sense to me <laughs> um but uh no it was very um you, no, can, was... you can guess what the thumbnail is gonna be then hey oh, you can guess what it's gonna be now. <laughs> it's yeah, gonna yeah, be exactly, a tin can yeah, <laughs> yeah nondescript yeah but no you're right that's that is the the kind of the that almost seemed like that was connor's main takeaway of course because he he wasn't aware of 
the relevance of what he was saying to what the group was doing until after they'd spoken. But his mm. main takeaway was that image of the tin can, not because it was a tin can, but because he had that image. And as you rightly said, he'd never had anything like that before um, yeah. when he does these spirit box um, uh, sort of experiments. So uh, I thought that was, um, yeah, I thought that was very, uh, yeah, I thought that was very, very interesting. And it, yeah, made, I mean, it, it made Connor feel really uneasy and almost kind of like he was, it was almost like he was pleased that it had happened because it was something new, but there was mm. a slight unease about it. And I think it was probably because he couldn't interpret it. He didn't know yeah. what it meant. And so it was kind of a case of, I guess, well, the unknown. That, that is the thing. That is the thing about with, with, with these sort of, uh, these sort of happenings is that it is so difficult to really, what do you take away from it? That's the problem. Exactly. What, yeah. What are you supposed to take away from that? I mean, you get this mental image of, 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 of a tin can and, you're like, what? What on earth does that mean? That, yeah. and this is the this is the strange thing. This is where the importance of synchronicities really starts to pick up in hindsight for me. Yeah. In that later on in the series, it becomes apparent as to why he got that image, um, and even even down to forty eight and forty eight minutes that he said. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the next day they decide that they're going to actually go into um into a town so pikeville kentucky which that's it yeah it's not too far away from jenkins where they've been it's staying not. no and the idea is to go and do a bit of reconnaissance on david christie see if he's actually had any property in the area um yeah any trace of license it. Yeah. employment history and they find nothing they 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 nothing. try all these various different courthouses they there's literally no sign of david christie local so, records and that's not just and that's not just there's no record of him in Kentucky because Pikesville sit or Pikeville, so they seem to be the kind of controlling county for mm. most of Kentucky. So these traces, there, there's no trace of him in anywhere in Kentucky. It's not just Hellier, but anywhere. You know, there was no record of buying property, as you say. There was yeah. no driving license. There was there was nothing to suggest that anyone by that name had been, um, you know, in the town. Obviously, with it being as small as it is, Hellier you know, mm. something like a doctor moving into a town like that would be local news. Everyone yeah. would be talking about it. Yet no fancy one had... doctor with their fancy car and his fancy family. And... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That, that sort of thing, isn't it? Exactly. And there was Sticking none of that. Sort of thumb. Absolutely, yeah. And there was just, there was just none of it. So again, as you said, they went to courthouses, they went to like local records, uh, like libraries and, you know, and, and, and that kind of thing. And yeah, there was just nothing. So they kind of quickly is... determined that the name David Christie doesn't exist. Now, it doesn't, that doesn't mean that th that person, so that person exist. doesn't exist, but they've just gone by, a, obviously, a different, hmm. you know, and a different the, name, presumably. They're, to coming to the, they're coming but... to the conclusion at this point that the story might be real, but David Christie might not. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, you know, they, it's a, it's it's a it, pseudonym yeah. that... Yeah, much like Terry Wrist or Terrorist. Yeah. <laughs> it's or a pseudonym. terrorist, yeah. It's a pseudonym, you know, it's yeah. a, a code name. It's TRW in the transcript and Greenfield's book, isn't it? TRW. Yeah, so T -R -W, Terry yeah. R. Wrist. Yeah. Terrorist. Terry you know, like... Wrist, yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, and it's a, yeah, so that they come to that conclusion quite quickly. Um, they try to meet up with their contact that they first uh, phone called when they arrived in, in Hellia two or three days prior. Um, because it was her grandson that had supposedly seen um, one of these footprints at the entrance of a cave That's right, um, yeah. and also found signs of a burial ground um, in and around the cave. But he basically lets them down at the last minute because he decides to go hunting. So mm. um, they don't go with him to, to find this place. However, they do bump into a guy who I think has been, his name's been changed for his protection, but they, they bump into a, a local who goes by the name Joey, um, who knew of the caves and, you know, the cave systems in that area. Um, he'd seen various carvings, like, uh, what's the word? Um, three-toed foot, footprints the, the and three -toed cave footprints paintings and, and, the and stuff like this. Native American, that's what I'm trying to think yeah. of. Native American carvings yeah. and, and that kind of thing. So Cornstalk, in fact, as well, which is really Cornstalk, quite interesting. Yeah, he named because, him specifically as well. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if anyone remembers, but from the, the Mothman episode that we did, Cornstalk yeah. came up in that. Chief Cornstalk, he yeah. uh, supposedly cursed the land that is West Virginia. Yeah. Um, and 
that potentially is why yeah the natives have never settled there yeah exactly yeah um, so know. i found that was um that was really interesting um and so what, what he does is he gives the group either coordinates or directions to various cave sites and and their entrances around the area and so the group set off to basically find them now he was now, now joey which is i think the name he went by it wasn't his actual name um he was a, a local caver um and he also for, i don't know they don't explain how he has this conversation but he speaks to a local school teacher um about the fact that he bumped into this group who had come to Helia. Well, he was talking at... to them. He was talking to the team about this retired school teacher that he actually had some info on three toed footprints and whatnot. And yeah. then after they spoke, exchange numbers before they do. And yeah. um, Joey's going off and he just happens to bump into this retired school yeah. teacher and says, you know what? I've got to call the team. I've got to call the team to tell them about it. Well, so, I think, yeah, the way wow, you... another is that another possible synchronicity, another coincidence where he was yeah. just talking about the guy, and so these coincidences are expanding beyond the team. Well, I think the way the way he came the team in a uh, in a particular direction. He, they obviously mentioned why they're there. They're there to look for goblins and whatever else. Joey says that you know he he knows that footprints have been found in in the area. He knows that him and other people have found, you know, carvings in the caves and on trees at the entrances of caves and that it's all Native American and stuff. And he said that there was a local group who actually photographed the footprints or, or originally found the pr- footprints similar to the photos that the group received from David Christie. And so he gives them these cave locations and that's where they're planning on, you know, setting off or whatever. Mm. It's then after that, that a separate interaction happens with Joey and this school teacher. And Joey mentions that he's bumped into this group. They're here in Helia to investigate weird and wonderful and goblins and whatever else. And it then turns out that this school teacher was one of the original group who found the footprints that Joey was referring to. And yeah. he was just like, I've never met this guy before. And then I mentioned him, I mentioned these footprints to you. And I happened to just bump into the guy that found them. And, yeah. and as you say, complete synchronicity. So he then phones the group and says, look, this has just happened. I've actually met, I've actually spoken with the guy. He, he then gives the group the name and number of this like school teacher. And they, they actually then manage to um, speak to him. But much and like that's... a lot of the locals, he's a bit tight lipped about a lot of the stuff mm. that he has seen at first. But, you know, it's like anything. You get someone talking about the right subject and you can't shut yeah. them up. But... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> evidently. <laughs> evidently. <laughs> yeah. But it, even even then, that's a, the, the conversation that they had with him was very weird because, yeah. like you say, at first he's a bit tight-lipped. But I also got the impression that there's been so much strange things happening in and around that area that they don't see it as strange. The locals don't see it as weird or stand out or, or anything like that, like, he, he was mentioned about yeah. seeing UFOs all the time. Yeah. You know, and, and he was the, really blase about it, wasn't he? And it? the odd thing about it as well was that in 2012 was the last time he had seen one. Mm. And that was the last time they received an email from David Christie. Yeah. And that's when obviously the whole Helio Goblins said, thing started. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, like, that, that was the last time that I ever saw like, that I've seen one. That was the last time I've seen one for a while yeah. now. Um, he said, "Yeah, we'd always hear about these strange occurrences around the ha- around the town, around the, the local area." My, it's, I think he said, "My my brother saw a Bigfoot once. I didn't see it, but he saw it." Yeah, yeah. And you know, it's. I think these things happen in these areas, and it doesn't seem strange to the locals. It's just part of life, because with a lot of these locals, they live, they they they're born, they live, they die in these areas. Yeah, exactly. They don't really yeah. venture out much. You know, it's, no. And that's kind of what I've got coming across from that particular conversation. Mm. Um, but it was the conversation that they had afterward, which was <laughs> more interesting. Yeah. And that comes from um, another investigator called Tyler Strand. And yeah. he's very much a, a lone wolf in re- with regards to investigations. He likes to just go out there with his camera, his camping gear, his hiking gear, and he goes off yeah. and he goes investigating. Um, Given an idea of the guy, he made, he reminded me of like a Duracell bunny. 
He's just, he's hyper. He's yeah. constantly like... He's so full of energy. That conversation yeah. with him on the phone is just like, oh my God, this is so amazing. I've got something to tell you. It's just yeah, like, yeah. Whoa, 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 calm down, mate, calm down. Yeah, calm yeah, down. Yeah. Someone's that, someone's that needs some Ritalin or something like that, you know? Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Start at the beginning and go yeah. slow. And, yeah. and this was the really interesting thing as to why he called them as well. Now, obviously, the the the, the, the new Kirks and Tyler Strand, they've known each other for years, so they're talking back and forth about the various different things that they've been investigating. And um, Tyler calls him up and he, he, like, he gets a text and said, like, I've had a breakthrough with regards to the Kentucky Goblins. Give us a bell. And it turns out that Tyler Strand was actually in Point Pleasant a couple of weeks prior for the Mothman Festival. He was, yeah. Um, and he actually found a link between the events of Point Pleasant, Indrid Cold, and these possible goblin sightings in Kentucky. So what happened was he'd actually got in contact with someone at the festival who had been compiling like a, a 90 page book about creature sightings in and around caves in mm. that area. Um, now he took the info um, from the books, from different books and accounts from um, across history and uh, like I said he's made a 90 page book and so he didn't really think much of it or anything like that but he thought oh, I've got to get this guy's number and I'm going to contact him soon so I can get this information and then what I'll do is I'll get it over to Greg and Dana now this was the now fast forward to a couple of weeks to this phone call that they're having and Tyler then says that he was at the gym and the whole time he was at the gym he kept thinking about this this bloke's um, information and uh, yeah. thinking about how it could really tie in with what Greg and Dana are doing at the moment. So he decides to decides to give him a call. Now, this is the really weird thing is that mm. the guy actually instantly picks up the phone and goes, you know what? I was actually just trying to find your number, Tyler. And I was scrolling through my contacts to find it, to call you about yeah. getting this book over to you. So he said, if, yeah. if you wait 10 more seconds, I would have been calling you. Yeah, yeah. Like what? Yeah, that, yeah. That's that's weird. That's yeah. a that's a synchronicity right there. That yeah. something has happened. That they've both experienced that synchronicity, but then it's extended on to Greg and Dana because it's yeah. about these these uh, creature sightings in and around caves. Now exactly. this is a really really weird thing. Now this yeah. can, this call goes on and on and on and on because <laughs> um, Tyler can yeah. clearly he can talk right. He yeah. can talk. You get this impression of him. It yeah. seems like I'd love to have a, a we'd get on with a him chat with him. Well. <laughs> oh, definitely. I reckon so. Um, now, this is the really, really funny thing, is that they hang up and Connor goes, whoa, guys, that call was 48 minutes, 48 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> what? From the script box that? session that he did before, wasn't it? He exactly. Just, he the, the night minutes. before, Connor had said 48 minutes. Yeah. So again, this is where those coincidences are piling up, guys. They're piling up, and because they initially because... looked back over that footage, didn't they? When he first said forty-eight minutes, Carl uh, Carl went through that video footage from that day at yeah. the forty-eight minute mark to see if anything happened, and it didn't. So they put it down as being like a, a dud uh, sort like of reference until yeah, he's pressed stop on the phone call. And it was exactly 48, 48. It's like, what? It like, what? Like, and it, and these... it was about, it was a synchronicity about a synchronicity. Yeah. Which led yeah. to a synchronicity. So it was just like a triple. It's like trifecta. inception <laughs> of, of synchronicities. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, you yeah. got to watch for that, that little spinner top to, to fall over. Fall over. You know? it, yeah. But yeah, it's like, this is where these coincidences are piling up and it's, it's becoming less and less probable that it's just coincidence. Like, yeah, this is where they start thinking this is by design. We're, we're being put on this path. Um, and this is really, well, this is where I, I took note of what Carl said, Carl Pfeiffer, the director, uh, yeah. what, what he had to say about it and, and the question that he puts forth. Um, and he says that, that these synchronicities might actually be manifestations of the phenomena. So mm. they, the, the phenomena that is these Kentucky goblins, the synchronicities might be a manifestation of them. Yeah. So what he means by that is, is that in the same way that a spirit can speak or touch you on the shoulder, it can appear to you or something like that, that in itself is a manifestation. But synchronicity might be a way that these goblin-like creatures manifest to us. Mm. So... 
what he's saying is it is it a way in which they communicate mm. so yeah you've got to follow this this these synchronicities that they're putting out there that um they might be making things happen hundreds of miles away mm. like with like with uh tyler he's hundreds of miles away but they're making things happen something's making it happen that he had this coincidental phone call with the guy that he's been speaking to at mothman to which then he's had to go guys i've got to tell you about this so that in itself is a message to them to the team that they're exactly. on the right path yeah exactly it's like, yeah. it gets very very gets very very complicated and you could easily get lost in these in these synchronicities and you could oh you could yeah you could easily try and find meaning in everything that happens yeah. you yeah. know this is the strange thing about it and but that's that's i think that's a really really interesting yeah. question was, to put forth by carl yeah no definitely it was um yeah, it, it was yeah, it was a theory that he that he came up with yeah, following the the Tyler Schoen conversation. But it was yeah, it definitely adds itself to, you know to some credibility and and yeah, I think it could be because um, too many happen to the same group in a short space of time. You know, f- for it to just be synchronicities, are they actually now, you know, meaning something? Are they, as you mm. say, these these creatures, you know, sort of communicating and uh, and whatever um and yeah no it was um no it was very uh very intriguing um obviously what happens next i found quite interesting and that kind of sets the pace for the rest of the uh the season um and it's their kind of debrief after all of that that's just gone on with tyler strand with the school teacher Mm. and speaking to this joey guy they're basically going through the footage of the day and Rashad, the producer, basically out of nowhere, just sort of says, oh, I wonder if we could track the IP addresses of the yeah. David Christie emails. Or or he says, could we do that? You know, has anyone tried doing it? Anyone thought and, to do it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> basically. And there's like an immediate scramble. Everyone's grabbing cameras and laptops and whatever else. And basically they search the main ip address from the first david christie email and it initially pops up from coming from um a vpn in iax ontario obviously in canada now for those that don't know greg and dana lived in ontario canada about an hour and a half away from iax ontario yeah so their heart fell out their backside basically when they read it <laughs> yeah when they found this out because it immediately just made them think oh shit like we've, we've been, been had done. we've been had here like this is a stitch up like the whole thing yeah. is just completely fabricated so dana's sitting there trying to think of every kind of like ghost hunter and paranormal investigator in the in that in ontario that would basically hate them enough to send them on a wild goose chase and you know greg's trying to sort of do the same after searching um after doing a little bit more searching, they realised that obviously this VPN and, and its whole purpose is to actually hide where the emails are originally coming from. And in fact, mm. there's actually a triangulation um, of of uh, locations. Obviously, you've got IAX, Ontario, uh, and then I think Los Angeles, California is one of them. Yes. And, uh, and then there's a third, which I'll be honest, has completely escaped me. But it's basically nowhere... F- it's nowhere from... Nowhere near. Hellier, basically, it's three locations around you know the united states and the thing is back in 2012 the vpns of, of virtual private networks weren't really something that prominently used i mean today yeah. now it's worthwhile because of all the various different data sharing it goes on yeah. from all these different locations from these different companies and like a vpn is a good way to protect your data um no paid yeah. advertising from you know here but guys and uh, and gals but it yeah. is a good way to hide your data from all these big corporations and yeah. back in 2012 it wasn't really something that was used very often but it wouldn't have well, been that prominent. the general public it wouldn't have been that prominent but, you'd have to be an it whiz or involved in communications of that kind to kind of know how to create one how to use one and you know and kind of everything else and their their perception of david christie was that he was a man in his sort of 50s or 60s lived in rural hellier kentucky with his family and so mm. wasn't really the poster boy for 
you know it whiz or you know um you know having yeah. the know-how to be able to do it so that kind of i mean that that really deflated them um greg especially who i think on camera actually said like you know basically he's fucking furious <laughs> more or yeah. less you know more or less um, yeah you know, it would be though wouldn't you yeah no, absolutely this and is they, like years in the making at this point yeah exactly know, like... when all the money and time that they've just wasted going around hellier looking for a guy and they've just pretty much well to, to then in terms of what they believe the guy doesn't and exist point, and he's yeah. a complete fabrication um connor calls a friend of his called steve who is a tech whiz um who, who is actually the one that helps them locate the origin, which of course they're unable to do because it's a VPN. Um, but he is able to find a sort of a, a triangulation. But that covers a vast, vast area of basically the United States. So there's no yeah. way of kind of honing in on one area or one state or or anything. No. So um, yeah, so they're now at a point where they now believe that David Christie and Terry Wrist are fakes their pseudonyms um however the people and their stories are real and that's what drew the group to helia and the story is just far greater than just a simple goblin hunt which is what they imagined mm. it would be which is obviously what we alluded to at the start of the uh start of the episode so and i think that kind of doing it at that point i think kind of ruins the end of the trip for them that was certainly the impression that i got um yeah because it really they, deflates them they they go to one of the, they basically one of the locations that this joey gives them is a disused train tunnel um and so they they go to there specifically there's something about it that that kind of draws them to that out of all of the other locations um and they're walking through like six foot like weeds and undergrowth to get up to this uh, entrance to the, the tunnel and they navigate their way through uh, they get into the entrance they don't really specify how far in they go but they go in fairly fairly deep and they as, as they're venturing in uh, <laughs> Connor uh, mm -hmm. is walking through shining his sort of torch around and uh, sees something on the floor and he it stops him in his tracks because what he has spotted amongst this disused train tunnel entrance yep. is a tin can. A tin fucking can. A, a dented <laughs> a dented tin can. And not only that, a tin can without the label on it. Yes. Matching exactly what he saw in his vision after the last uh, spirit box uh, experiment. Uh, you, you, you could argue a tin can is a tin can and like... Yeah. It, it just looks like a tin can, but he's adamant. He's yeah. ad absolutely adamant. It's the one that he saw. It's the yeah. one that he saw. The and size, the place, the, the same. Match. Yeah. They even and tested it, it to make sure it was. It's metal. quite funny. It's quite funny if you've just kind of dropped into the the series at this point, yeah. and you see their footage of it, and it's just like yeah. a couple of couple of people huddled around this tiny this this small tin can losing their in a mind. tunnel <laughs> and they're poking they're poking it with pens and, and flicking it and they're losing their minds You're like what yeah. uh, are these are these people on drugs yeah you know, but if that's the bit where... you tuned into as you say that you'd think what are these guys on like, <laughs> what they... the fuck yeah but it's the importance of the synchronicities that it's these things so keep that, popping yeah. up and they're not just popping up they're piling up you yeah. know that there, there's there's got to be a meaning surrounding it yeah um it's it's such a a, a standalone thing just this unassuming tin can yeah um this is the thing this is like they don't really understand what it is that's going on or yeah. even what's really kind of brought them to this point because yeah they went searching for goblins yeah and they've found so much more well not and even found but they've they've come into contact with so kind much of dropped more into than... their lap it's like and that was the that that was the seed that the, the goblins was the seed that kind of grew, you know, that started this whole thing, and just everything yeah. else has just branched out from it. You know, you've got ties to because, Mothman because they started Cole. paying attention to those synchronicities. Yeah, I think exactly. that's what it is. They don't fob them off as just coincidence. They treat them mm. as a well form of communication, as they later, you know, determine. Yeah, they, they yeah, take I them. Think it's... Sort of I think that's seriously. a very, very strong theory that Carl came yeah. up with there, that, it, yeah. that it's, 
it's quite possible that it is a form of communication that we don't understand because we're such linear beings. You yeah, know, exactly. We, yeah. We exist in just a very, very small spectrum of existence. Yeah. That, yeah precisely. That we can yeah. Um, <laughs> exactly. But, yeah, we'll, we'll save that bit for later. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> we've got to get off the fence, really. We don't want to be doing that bit, that bit too early. Well, no, um, exactly. And, um, and so, it, it, it kind of wraps it up really because i know there's a couple of bits that you want to go into which kind of this leads into but the the group um start by again another uh intention uh ritual which uh which dana does um on the floor um which yeah again just sets their intention why they're there who they want to communicate with why they want to communicate and that they're there with good intentions basically so they they set that out um that Daniel that then does a fairly quick uh, tarot uh, reading, um, which isn't too. They're, they're three different cards from when she does it at the start of the weekend, but they basically bring them to the same conclusion in terms of how they have viewed their trip to Helia. Um, so there wasn't any real. Well, she kind of does. She does the tarot card reading after um, the various experiments that they mm. do. So they do another spirit double blind spirit box session. Um, but before they do that, yeah. um, that's Connor that, that does the, the Connor does that again, again, yeah. But before they do that, Greg takes part um, and conducts a, a slightly different experiment, albeit right. very similar, but it's called the Gansfield experiment. That's right. Now, the what entails with the Gansfield experiment is um, you take two halves of a ping pong ball and you place them over your eyes um, and you tape them down. And what you do is you then shine a light onto onto the ping pong balls. And the idea is that your eyes can't detect whether or not your lids are closed or they're open because yeah. you just see this red light regardless. Now, the idea is that it's supposed to trick your, your body into some ESPs or extrasensory perception. Mm. Now, along with that, then he also puts on that noise cancelling headphones where they play pure white, white noise. noise so this isn't like with the spirit box where it cycles through um the fm frequencies yeah. it's just purely pure white, white noise. noise nothing else yeah and um the idea is that it's, it's a, a sensory deprivation sort of thing so yeah. um along the same sort of lines as say like an isolation tank mm. now people that have um been in isolation tanks have reported incredibly psychedelic experiences because you're a psych, a, 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 an isolation tank is complete sen sensory deprivation. You've got no outside noise. Mm. You are floating in a solution that is body temperature, so you essentially feel weightless. Um, you just basically lie there, close your eyes, and let your mind wander. And people have had some incredibly prolific um, experiences and it, sometimes even spiritual awakenings mm. in these isolation tanks. I first heard about them on the Joe Rogan podcasts and right, okay. if anyone's listened to that, then he goes into what an isolation tank is in a lot more detail. Yeah. Um, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to move on. Um, so that is essentially what the Gansfield experiment is, is trying to do with the added, um, input of the red light and the white noise um so the experiment allows the participant to uh to be cl as close to sensory deprivation without the use of a tank um which means you can conduct it anywhere in particular hot spots of activity um or areas that have been deemed to have strong en energies flowing through them ley lines uh the, the yeah electromagnetic grid that you get across the earth um it's like a meditation sort of thing and, and this is something that i can attest to through my own personal experience that i've had some incredible um experiences through meditation so through deep deep meditation yeah um even out of body experience yeah. um which i've spoken to you about yeah, Carl, know, yeah. that was yeah, that, that was, was incredible that was absolutely mind-blowing i even cried afterwards because mm. i just that was just incredible. Mm. Um, now, Craig, ha Greg, um, Greg has done this experiment um, many times before, and he started things off. And it, he started things off by just putting the headphones on. He had the, the the ping pong balls, and as soon as he started playing the white noise, 
things started happening for him. Mm. He, he could hear um, like a crowd of people shouting. He said like it sounded like the team were shouting, um, almost like they were at a football game. So Carl asks, who's on the outside of this, Greg, remember, you can't hear him, can't see him, no, like the spirit box ses- session, and goes, are you excited that we're here? Then explains that that they can communicate f- with them through Greg, through intention and uh, f- thought transference, yeah, or telepathy, for mm. want of a better noise. Then a couple of weird things start happening. They hear a car horn off in the distance. Yeah. Um, just like a almost like you're locking a car, yeah, or something like that, that sort of sound. Um, and then Greg starts saying that he, he starts seeing things now. So he's starting to experience um whether they're hallucinations or visions or a psychedelic experience, whatever it may be, but he starts seeing uh watching trees and street lamps flying past him. It's like yeah. he's looking out of a window to his right. Um, and he thinks that he, he might be on a train. He's gone through a tunnel. And this is the really weird thing as well. Some, the things are also happening around him. They hear further into the tunnel a whisper. Yeah. They hear something say, guys. Yeah. So they hear something saying, guys, about 15 feet yeah. further into the tunnel. They start freaking out a little bit. Mm. Now, this is where Connor asks them, wherever it may be. Um, to show Greg what they look like. Now, this was really, really interesting. So Greg starts describing what he's seeing. And he says that he's lying on his back, looking up, and he's staring through a ring of trees. And now he's actually starting to feel things. So he's not just seeing things, but he's starting to feel things now as well. And he feels that his body is vibrating Mm. and that it's going cold. Where in actual fact, the temperature around him has actually gone up by a degree. Yeah, and I would, I would right. a, a degree in Fahrenheit, I believe, rather than mm. Celsius. Yeah, so Fahrenheit. It's, yeah, yeah, it's minimal to anyone else, but to um, uh, like uh, a sensor or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to the Americans, it means something. To yeah. to us that do Celsius, it means nothing. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't mean anything really, but yeah. it's something that could be detected. So the yeah, temperature yeah. actually went up yeah. around him, but he was. Cold. Of being cold, yeah, yeah, and then he starts seeing a face peering over him, and mm. it's got these brilliant, bright blue, large eyes. Um, now at this point, the ground is vibrating, and he's starting to get a bit freaked out, he's starting to panic a little bit, he doesn't mm. like it. No, and he goes, Something's looking over him, so something's looking over, him. and he goes, It's like an alien gray, but with bright blue eyes, and then there's flashes going on behind the trees, and then all of a sudden. The audio stops. Yeah, it just the 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 the, the, stops. Um, the audio buffers. Yeah, and it stops it at that exact buffering point. At that point. Yeah, and like this is also this is something that I picked up on. I don't know if you did, but Dana's ears started ringing she like said it, crazy. It's she a said. constant ringing in my ears. Yeah, mm. which is a, a paranormal. Um, well, some people have connected ears ringing in those situations to. Um, some sort of paranormal force trying to communicate directly to you. So not through the means of um, one of these experiments or yeah. synchronicity or anything like that, but actually no, literally just a, trying yeah. to talk to you. Um, so obviously this got the team freaked out and Greg and like it specifically got quite freaked out by yeah. it because essentially what he's describing there is an abduction experience. Mm. Which and we've people, spoken about yeah. the, in late in earlier episodes where the abduction might not actually be a physical thing. It might be either your, your mind being abducted or your soul or your astral being, whatever it may be, that part of existence that we really don't understand. No, exactly. That might be what's being abducted mm. and being taken to have these experiments done and, and such. But it seems like Greg's quite relieved that it stopped right there. Yeah. Really. At that um, point, yeah, but and they quite also frankly, I would be and all, but and they also felt that it was meant to finish at that point. Like Connor said, yeah. you know, show him what you look like. They showed him what they looked like, and then they decided That's to it. then cut it there. So, although he was happy for it to end at that point, it also seems like whoever they were communicating with decided to end mm. it at that point and kind of, you know, took the matters into the uh, you know their own hands. 
Yeah, and but, this um, is, uh, and whilst they're in the tunnel, this is something that I noted noted as well is that the tunnel didn't have an echo. No, there was no. They echo. said that it didn't didn't have an echo. There was no there was no graffiti there. So, the, like, if it was an area where like kids hung out or something like that, and there was like some weird ghost stories about this tunnel that kids hung out in and and everything, then yeah, it'd be stuff written on the walls. It'd be yeah, exactly litter yeah. and. There'd be more than just a tin can. And there'd be, there'd more, be yeah, exactly, yeah, beer bottles you know, or, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and what they were finding was that there was stuff that was moving around. So they heard like a concrete slab move and yeah. tonk into the wall. Around the um, same distance where they heard the whisper, wasn't it? Deeper yeah. into the tunnel, yeah. Yeah, so there's, so to kind of describe it, if, without you guys actually watching the documentary yourselves, um, there seems like there's two piles of rubble and, they're kind of um, doing their experiments on one pile and then further into the tunnel, there's another pile. Mm. And they think that this, whatever it is, is something watching them. It's something that's moving around over there. That is what is communicating with them through these various different means. Yeah. Um, so now the, the, the team is really starting to feel up until this point, they felt a lot of anxiety and a lot of, like edginess um, yeah uncomfortable feeling that that vibe that we mentioned earlier that it was yeah just, and it's and it's persisted it was an uncomfortable all the way place through, to be yeah and it's persisted all the way through the investigation as well yeah. but all of us and and every now and then there might be like a little sense of um serenity that mm. just drops in just to calm them down and they just feel all nice and relaxed it's almost like it's going if this is all by design it's almost like it's going Okay, let's get you. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Right, okay, stop. Calm down. Mm. Let's calm down. Yeah. Right, let's go again. Now let's you go. Know, yeah, it's almost yeah. like it's doing that. It's like a hand holding um, thing throughout the whole. Is that yeah. something? Something's guiding them, but at, at a pace that they know they can kind of that handle. They could, that they wouldn't explode yeah. their fucking minds. Yeah, and, know, it get, and it all gets close to that point, and that's when yeah, I think they they shut off the. Uh, they shut off the uh, Gansfeld um, experiment and they go, right, that's it now. We've, we've shown you enough for now. Obviously, you're getting a mm. bit, you know, a bit jittery, a bit excited. You know, let's, let's kind of <laughs> yeah. it, let's end things there for now. Yeah. And yeah, as you say, potentially... they, they know, don't they, a complete change in yeah. temperament. Like I so said, they were very, very anxious, very kind of hit up and, you know, sort of uptight with that sort of uncomfortable feeling. And then I don't think they'd even officially finished the experiment, but Carl stood up and sort of made the point of like he's like I feel I feel like we're done like I feel like it's yeah. finished like I, I don't I don't feel like we need we haven't got what we needed but I feel like we've got everything that we're gonna and that's and that's yeah. kind of it we need to end things there and they all sort of commented that they were sort of more almost more at peace with it than what they had been mm-hmm. throughout the whole you know four days is, they were in Hellier which is really weird because Very a odd, minute or two yeah. before it they were all freaking out because Greg was explaining his abduction hearing shit experience. and seeing stuff and yeah, yeah. Like ears ringing and not ringing and yeah so this was this was the point that Dana decided to do the tarot card reading and um I, I know I, I understand the intention with regards to tarot cards but I've never actually um taken the time to get involved with it and actually learn about what the tarot card reading is all about but luckily yeah. enough my fiance sam she's very much into it and yeah. with our phone call on thursday she kind of gave us a little <laughs> bit of info into it and yeah now, she did definitely yeah she said uh, so what cards did they draw at the end there then and luckily enough she actually went back yeah she did through the footage <laughs> She did a screenshot, sent it over to us and explained what it was all about. So yeah. for anyone that does know about tarot card reading, Dana drew three cards and she drew the Hanged Man, the Ace of Pentacles and the Emperor. Now, the um, Ace of Pentacles and the Emperor were both reversed um, and they were um, there was like a north-south divide between them. Now, if any of the cards are reversed, it means that it is literally the opposite of what it means to be. So the Ace of Pentacles, the image that is on the card is a hand um, peering through clouds, holding a pentacle, like a coin of such. So it's the way that it, it, it is described is that 
it's about your possessions or comforts of stability, you know, with that hand holding that pentacle in place. So with it being reversed, it's a loss of it because the coin is falling out of the hand. So this is one thing that Dana says. She says that there's a loss of material possessions, comforts or stability within this. Um, the emperor, which was inverted, is a corruption of power, she says. So she interprets it as a, a as a, a corruption of power and the hanged man is best described at looking at things from another angle so if we're to base that i mean apparently the hanged man came up a couple of times in the other readings that they had so it's like they've they're almost on the right path but they've just got to look at things from a different angle so mm. any of the listeners that do think that there's anything to tarot card reading or even if you don't you know mm. there's that all these things are a bit woo woo. They're all open to interpretation. Yeah. To a certain degree, so are synchronicities. Yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's what I found f- from that. Um, yeah, because but... what we view as a synchronicity or what the group saw as a synchronicity, someone who doesn't believe in that just might be like, oh, well, that's just, com- that's just coincidence. Yeah. That's nothing more but the, than. But also, than there's that, a story you know? behind the hanged man as well. The hanged man is, is there to see things from another angle in order to gain. Mm. or some sort of knowledge or whatever it is i mean just the one that always comes to mind and it always comes to mind with me with me thor's hammer around my neck as we speak yeah. Yeah. um the hanged man i always think of odin the all father yeah. he hanged from the yggdrasil for i think it was nine days and nine nights yeah um in order to gain the perspective i believe on the rooms a different perspective wasn't it yeah of, or he was to gain p- perspective on uh, gain knowledge of the runes or poetry i can't remember which yeah. one off the top of my head but um i think it was gaining knowledge in, in particular mm. um but it, it was the sac the sacrifice of hang of being hanged mm. you've got to see things from another angle yeah um so yeah. is this tarot card reading saying that they need to sacrifice their possessions comforts and stability in order to gain this other Perception. This other knowledge, yeah. And do they need to confront a corruption of power mm. in order to gain that knowledge as well? Yeah. Um, because it literally went um inverted the, the way she drew it is the emperor, the ace of pentacles, and then the hanged man. Yeah. So a lot of it does seem like it's open to interpretation, but um It'd be interesting to see what other people, if there's any listeners out there that, that do practice tarot, yeah, tell us what you might think of that. Yeah. If you've listened to us so far, yeah. and let us know us. what your interpretation yeah. might be. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to know because I'm 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 still sort of very much on the fence with it. I, I don't know enough about it to comment one way or another. So I'm not. I can't, in good you know, in good faith, kind of poo poo all over it. But I also can't yeah. be 100 percent into it because I just don't know you know, I don't know enough about it, but there was a lot about what the guys were doing that to me just made it seem like they were just trying to make it fit their own narrative. And they were trying to shoehorn it into what they wanted it to mean, which is quite interesting when you say like, you know, it's all about sort of perception. So, you know, they could have drawn those cards and interpreted it one way. And then another group could have got the same three cards, but to them it would have meant completely, you know, something different. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's it's interesting that it is sort of all about that, but yeah, without think with, knowing, I'm a little bit on the fence with it. But I think with the the power of tarot cards comes from doing a reading for someone that you've never interacted with before, yeah. and what you no interpret as as yeah. the the dealer, I suppose. Yeah. I suppose yeah. your interpretation of the cards might be um, synchronous to the person that you're reading for. So it is a slightly different situation where that they're doing a reading for themselves yeah and then making an interpretation so there's there is the possibility of you know the conflict of interest or conflict of interest even so it could just be that oh because because of the sort of minds that we have we've been able to watch things like most haunted and the Derek chorus of this world and uh, all the the various different faith healers and and such and gun right okay i can see where they've done a load of bullshit there and yeah uh, but with regards to i think there is something to it in a lot of cases a lot of charlatans out there and i do i like your point though where they could have just shoehorned it in mm. 
they could that's have done. The, that's certainly the vibe that, that, that I got, but that's coming from a place of not um, scepticism, but I'm not, not fully on board yet. So that's just mm. kind of my... Just looking at it as it is, taking it in as, as presented, that's kind of my, you know, where I'm landing, you know, in terms of well, terror reading. Last, as a, well, this time last year, mate, you didn't even finish the first episode of Hellier. You just went, that's bollocks, I, mate. Mate, I couldn't get past the first episode. <laughs> I, 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 thought, I thought you have got to be joking. Like, like Oh, times have changed. Uh, honestly, yeah. But I was, I was watching, I'm thinking, you know, the first episode... It's like already there are just so many loose ends and so many reasons to think, yeah, this is just complete nonsense. Mm. And I thought, there's five episodes of them just what dragging this out. The fact that it might be complete nonsense, but obviously, little did I know that that it actually developed or, or um, grew from just being about a potential goblin hunt into kind of what we now know is, you know, you know, sort of far, you know, far more than that. And um, yeah. You know, I don't know whether that's a good point to start coming off the fence, but but yeah, basically, yeah. It, it, and this is going to be more of a summary as opposed to a, an off the fence because, as, as we said, there is a second season which we yeah, there's a it, this is an off the fence up, which, which I'm yet now. to finish, but it's, it's an up to, yeah, an off the fence up to this point. So season one of Helia, and yeah, I, I would say that yeah, it's definitely not just as simple as finding goblins, you know, crawling out of a cave there is um there is far more to it and mm. it's from these links to other phenomena other you know towns within the states and all the various different people that are involved for all their different reasons that have blown this up to be yeah to, to i think more more about the the phenomena of you know visits and communications from other beings and how they go about doing that how we interpret interpret it as a as a, a species uh, you know as a race and mm. this is just a a blip in kind of or not even a blip but a, an, an opening in that kind of phenomena um the, the way i imagined it um which might be a bit you know sort of layman ish but you yeah. know if, if you imagine just a, i've just imagined it as just a long like this phenomena just being a long long ass like hallway or corridor and there are doors on you know, each side running all the way up, and yeah. and the Helia, the Helia goblins phenomena. It's just it's just one of those doors that you could open, and there's just there's just fucking everything else. But it's all you know, connected. But it's all connected because it's obviously on the same corridor. But it's yeah. all connected. But they're all just little doors, little windows that that kind of branch off this one this one phenomena, and we're just slowly getting through all of the doors and being like, oh fucking hell, and you know this is what we're seeing and this, you know, and that's why I, you know, I like the, that analogy. Do you yeah. know what I mean, that's, that's like kind it. of how I've, that's how I've kind of pieced it together. Certainly f for me to explain it, but for also me to kind of understand where my, you know, belief might mm. be on it and, and my, my sort of thought process. So, yeah, so I'm sort of on the side of the fence in terms of believing that something is going on, that there is a phenomena and that these guys are just on the, tip of the iceberg of what they're potentially going to uh uncover and yeah it isn't just as simple as finding a little group of goblins who you know live in a cave system you know deep beneath you know the uh the american uh landscape <laughs> mm. there's um you know i mean that could still quite easily be the case there could still be creatures of some of some description, you know, kind of living down there because I doubt people have gone and investigated it. You know, a lot of them have been blocked for a reason. Um, but um, yeah, that's yeah. kind of where I am on it. There, there, there is a phenomena. There is far more to it, and it isn't easy, easy, easily explainable by just yeah, goblins terrorizing families, or um, even horned owls or horned or owls yeah i mean as yeah. Know, it's definitely not owls, <laughs> whether it be horned yeah. or barn. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, that's that's kind of in in summary at this point, that's kind of where I am with yeah. it. I mean, the fact that it's got you know it's got Mothman in there, you know, which we know has been well documented and you know and sort of proven, you know, sort of to an extent, you know, we, you know, you've got Injured Cold, which is probably still to date my favourite kind of cryptid and my favourite episode. So I'm kind of heavily you know invested and, and 
whatever in, in that one. Mm. And we, so with him being involved and, and Hellier drawing up more links and more information that even you and I didn't know about Injured Cold, and we'd done a, a close to two-hour episode on him. So yeah. the fact that that's all come out as well and, you know, it, it comes back to synchronicities. I think that's the that's the kind of the main takeaway. Mm. There are too many synchronicities and in, in involvements of other things to discount this as as a hoax david christie doesn't exist but someone does exist who used the name david christie um you yeah. know terry wrist does exist but they've used the pseudonym terry wrist and they could be one of the same david christie and terry wrist could be the same person but they've taken they've decided to take on these different identities to i don't know set them on the right path or to try and make the path maybe a bit clearer than if they just yeah. came to them as this one person or this one being, um, you know, a theory that I, you know, sort of shared with you, I think only earlier actually, um, or last night was, um, was that, you know, could Terry wrist be injured cold? It's a strong um, or, possibility. You know, or, or vice versa. Could it be injured cold communicating with someone that he knows is on that plane, you know, that he could sit on that right path with, mm. You know, obviously Woody Derenberger being, you know, obviously passed away. Was he then trying to look for someone else who he could communicate with, who he knew would help him unearth all of this stuff? Because, like Terry Wrist's email said, you know, mm. injury Ian cold, black is still Ian isolated, and black is still isolated. Yeah, you know, the third, the the third order are, are MIA. Um, and yeah, so that that was something as well that wasn't. Um, that didn't come up in the documentary, but I had to look into as to what the third Who order they were, actually yeah. is. Um, so it turns out that the third order, um, they actually invited Indrid Cold and, and his people to take refuge to on take Earth. To take refuge on Earth, and they would protect them, and that they yeah. would help them sort of see out their And that there was purpose. this this, um, this war going on between um the humans of the, yeah. the intergalactic human like yeah. beings and uh greys yeah the, the greys and that's a that's that's a, a theory and a story that's cropped up a lot with yeah i mean that's a an episode contact isn't it yeah it was i can't remember the terminology they used but it was basically humans and and post-humans post-humans that's it well done post-humans post -humans, yeah, who are it. enough to qualify as earth's representatives in space-based governments yeah and the, the cold, whoever he is hasn't heard from the third order at all yeah for some for some time and so he's mm. isolated slash stuck yeah, he made on a earth. good point about he could be could be reaching out could he be reaching out because well yeah i mean yeah, we learned something else in season two, which kind of does affect <laughs> affect that theory somewhat. But um, a little bit. Yeah. Well, you've kind of jumped ahead. I haven't I haven't started season two again yet. No, I, I did have to. I did have to start. Yeah, but um, yeah. But yeah. So, but what's your, what's your takeaway? What's your summary of where we are at the moment? I think um, when I first started watching this again, the first time I watched it was years ago when it first was available on Amazon, and I'd heard yeah. about it from um, another podcast. And I was instantly taken by it. Mm. Um, but I think that's because for years now, I've been interested by these subjects and, and for years I've believed in the possibility of them being real, that there really is something that goes beyond what we exist, that what we experience on a day-to-day -day yeah. basis that we yeah. do very much only see a very, very small spectrum of light. We feel yeah. a very, very small spectrum of um, sensations as well it's second time round watching this i realized the importance of synchronicities and yeah. that there's it's not just about coincidences and this first season it's only five episodes it's, they're about an hour each yeah if you really do pay attention to what is going on you will understand the importance of synchronicities as well yeah. and and how that can tie into what you do on a day-to-day -day basis so that in itself then opens up the various different questions as to what is the nature of existence is it yeah are we here on purely a uh, free will basis or is everything by design mm. you know is every so are these synchronicities these synchronicities certainly seem like they are by design um and even greg mentions that at points it goes beyond 
synchronicity forum and teasing yeah and that's when they yeah. start coming up with the idea that it's a form of communication yeah. like yeah. you yeah you guys you get in there you got there you got there let's get to this point let's get to the brick wall yeah so like they would gain a bit of momentum they then go find go to find david christie find nothing mm. they'd go right okay right let's get a bit more enthusiasm let's go and find his house got nothing, nothing. right well, there's all these caves in this in these areas do you reckon we could narrow it down? No, it could be any one of these thousands of caves. Oh, yeah. Right, okay. So I can understand that they've been pointed in the right direction, but they're being told to slow it down a little bit. Yeah. Like what you said. Yeah. Bring it back a little bit. Bring it back a bit and then because we could and... show you. Yeah. A God knows how many things, and it will literally blow your mind, and you would become yeah. schizophrenic, and you'd be yeah. chucked away. You know that sort of thing because so they've been pointed in the right direction, but they're not taking the right path at the moment. And I, I think, think kind of. I think that's why. No, been no, no. I think they are. I think they are taking the right path. I think they are, but I think they're just being told to slow down a bit because humanity's not ready for it. I mentioned yeah. this in 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 other conclusions that we've done, other getting like off the fences that we've done, and I don't think we as a people are ready for it, even down to an individual yeah. level, because we don't have the knowledge that would be needed to be able to, for instance, communicate in this way. Yeah. Um, the best sort of description that I or example that I could probably give of that is um, what was that film? Was it called Contact? I don't know. There's like an oval egg shaped spacecraft that landed and these creatures communicated in a written form, but in the, it was circular. I can't okay. remember the name of the bloody film, but it had Amy Adams in it. And she basically, oh, she yeah. learned the language. Jeremy Renner realized, was in it, wasn't he? I think Jeremy. Yes, he was. Yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah, I haven't seen it, but I know what you mean. Yeah, it's a really good film. Yeah. It's a really good way to. It's very thought provoking, in that um, language, how we experience time dictates how we communicate. Yeah. So, so for instance, the way these beings were communicating was, um, it was, they experience their existence outside of space and time so they don't experience it the same way we do in a linear yeah. form so if you think about it everything that we do with regards to communication is linear we write in lines mm. you know these creatures they they communicated cyclically yeah. so it's all in circles so when amy adams character started learning this language and um, communicating with them like it she started experiencing time differently. Right. So she was able to make different things happen in her timeline mm. that she was able to jump back and forth with him. And I think that okay. it's a very, very interesting concept to explore that if synchronicities are that sort of way of communication, yeah, then these beings experience, they don't experience time the same way we do. They don't yeah. experience it in a linear sort of fashion. They yeah. potentially might have landed in 1955 in Hopkinsville and then just gone underground literally and figuratively mm. and then are now ex trying to communicate through synchronicities in a way that we can understand those it. that yeah. are noticing in it yeah. are able to yeah. communicate back. Yeah. Um, and then when you add this cipher into it as well, mm. it just opens up so much more. So I guess what I'm saying is I don't think I can get off the fence. It's opened up so much more for me yeah. in that there's so much more mystery involved in this that yeah, it definitely has yeah. the potential that there is these creatures that we're able to communicate with. They are outside of space and time and what that could potentially mean yeah for humans or yeah. even for post humans um, yeah. which is an interesting term yeah exactly um, yeah. I did but that. if i was if i was to get off the fence yeah i reckon there's goblins in kentucky so <laughs> 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 all that you that's what just, i reckon i reckon there's it's oh. a long story short <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's goblins long story goblins longer exist. there are goblins yeah Okay. Drop the mic. See you later. Ta -ta. See and you in episode is, 14. That's it from me. <laughs> bye bye. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I would say that yeah. really. Okay. I think it just opens yeah. up so much more possibility. And oh, it does definitely. Yeah. 
with regards to the um, the experiments that they do, man, I really want to have a go at the the, the blind, double blind spirit box and even that. Yeah, that'd be quite cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I can draw upon my own personal experience with meditation yeah. and being in the right frames of mind. And yeah, although I'm a little bit worried about you know an abduction experience, I'm a little bit yeah, worried exactly. About that. Yeah, and, if, and coming back from it, that's probably more my thing. Not getting trapped yeah. in that kind of realm or whatever it may be yeah, well yeah i mean i'll, I'll talk to you about the, with, the various but... different things that i've been involved yeah. in yeah i know um, yeah different ceremonies and and such and yeah. the fears that i have with infinite black voids yeah and, and, well, such. and astral um, astral projection and not being able to get back to your body and all that yeah. kind of thing so yeah it's um not something to be missed with unless you know no. kind of what you're doing but uh no it's certainly um intriguing but uh but no, so obviously for anyone that's uh, still with us, obviously there is a season two, so we will be doing a follow-up episode um, on t- on this, um, which may well be in two parts. Um, we've not decided yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, season one was five episodes, season two is ten. ten so yeah. so uh, we may need to do averages. part one and part two for season two, uh, depending on uh, kind of how it goes. But we've not started watching it. Well, I've certainly not finished it yet. I know Scott's not started since he... Mm first saw it a few years ago so um there will be a follow-up episode to hopefully finish the story on on helia um and that will be uh yeah that'll be coming as always in the next uh next couple of weeks but um but no that that leaves us uh kind of on at the end of season one um and covering all things helia i hope you've uh enjoyed it we've we've certainly uh enjoyed going through it and uh we'd recommend mm-hmm. highly going and actually watching it you know for yourselves like i say season one is only um five uh five hours it's five episodes yeah each one's roughly between 45 and an hour yeah. um and yeah i would also suggest not doing what i did and dismissing it after the first episode <laughs> stick <laughs> Actually, with it guys stick with it because you'll get well you'll get to where we are now and uh we're fully fully invested and yeah absolutely loving what the guys are unearthing um you know thus far so um yeah, so we'll leave links for for those we'll yeah we'll send links link to yeah. greg and dana's website as well so you guys can go check out their stuff go and check out other stuff that they've updates. done as well yeah definitely and uh yeah share everything that we can on the uh on the socials but um yeah we'll i guess we'll wrap things up uh quite nicely there so as always thanks for sticking with us hope you've uh enjoyed this one and on that note it's goodbye from me and it's goodbye from me and remember don't kick any tin cans because you'll never know who it might be <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> I like it. <laughs>